should have known you'd bid me farewell there's a lesson to be learned from this and i learned it very well now i know you're not the only starfish in the sea if i never hear your name again it's all the same to me and i think it's gonna be all right yeah the worst is over now the morning sun is shining like a red rubber ball Never cared for secrets I'd confide to you. I'm just an ornament, something for your pride. Always running, never caring. That's the life you live. Stolen minutes of your time were all you had to give. And I think it's gonna be alright. Yeah, the worst is over now. The morning sun is shining like a red rubber ball. The stories in the past with nothing to recall I've got my life to live and I don't need you at all The roller coaster ride we took is nearly at an end I bought my ticket with my tears that's all I'm gonna spend and I think it's gonna be all right Yeah the worst is over now the morning sun is shining like a red rubber ball oh, oh. It's gonna be all right. Yeah, the worst is over now. The morning sun is shining like a red rubber ball. Oh, oh, it's bouncing and it's shining like a red rubber ball. Well, hey, baby, jump over here when you do the. I wanna be near
It's right here. Just it, it deselected the Eddie. There it goes. We're hot. Okay. Hot pickle, guys. Uh, this is now a live fire range. Well, uh, hello, Glue Troopers. Max and Max's models here. And uh, we are very lucky that tonight we not only have our usual cast, uh, Ken and Steve, but we have renowned aviation artist Mike Machat with us. Mike? Hello, Glue Troopers. Hi, everybody. Good to be with you. Always a pleasure to be on. And uh, I, I wanted Mike to uh, chime in because we are going to be talking about uh, two uh, very famous people uh, that's uh, in, in our world. That's Jack Linwood uh, and Roy Cross. And uh, I, there's no better authority than uh, Mike as he has uh, actually, um, uh, you've done an article on Jack. And uh, I tell you what, I've got, let me move my logo off here. So. I've got, I know we're running on about a 20 second delay from what you see, but I've got the picture up, the Art of Roy Cross and Crowding the Box, which uh, you say is an article you did on Jack, not a book. Yeah, it was a cover uh, story in uh, Wings and Air Power magazine back in the early 2000s. <clears throat> well, why don't you remember what that means, Crowding the Box? Crowding the Box is kind of what you see there with that B-17. He would uh, <clears throat> crop the wing tips off and, and just make the airplane explode out of the box towards you. And uh, in composition terms, that's, that's called crowding the image. And he always just said he wanted to make the airplane look like it was just leaping off the box right at you in the hobby shop. And that made you uh, look at it, which made you then buy the model. And that was his job. That's the way he, did. That's the way he always described it to me. You know, that, that, was, bring, that, brings, that brings up the point. I, I now remember the question I wanted to ask you, okay? Yeah. And I think this image is probably perfect. 
because I don't think there are two more respected artists in box art than than Linwood and Cross. Um, I would agree. I would agree. And I, I believe Roy is still alive at 100 years of age, I believe. Oh, God uh, bless him. That's right. Um, we're very close to it. So uh, you just touched on something very important, you know, about the ideas to get you to buy the model. Mm -hmm. What? How would you describe the difference between this commercial box art and quote-unquote fine art? Uh, that's a beautiful question, an age-old question, and uh, I'm not trying to be uh, flippant about the answer here, but in my world, which is, I have done both. I've done fine art for gallery and sold commissions, and I've done tons of commercial art for commercial clients, and um, please understand how I say this. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it a little bit in a second. <clears throat> the difference between fine art and commercial art Commercial art is paid for before it's made. And fine art is paid for after it's made. And that's it. Okay. Because to me, commercial box top art is fine art in my world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but what they mean is commercial art is, is commissioned. Uh, they hire an artist to make a movie poster, a magazine cover, a book cover, a model box top, whatever it's going to be, to do what? To sell a product advertising right okay and fine art is created goes into a gallery someone walks in sees it and goes oh my gosh that's stunning it would look great over my couch it matches the drapes i gotta have it mm -hmm. and that's that's the the dynamic involved but to me uh, regardless of the fact that it's airplanes whatever a uh, much of the fine art much of the i'm sorry much of the bo uh, the model box art that i see is fine art period mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I don't know if that's where you wanted me to go. No, no. I was just kind of, since you're in that world, I was wondering what makes a guy go, well, this is fine art and this is, you know, not. And uh, that makes sense. One's basically a commission and the other is you, you paint it and hope somebody buys it. Yeah, and there's one other word to throw in uh, which makes the distinction, and that's the word illustration. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine art is paintings, fine art paintings and galleries. Commercial art is illustration on product. So okay. that's the other thing. But if I may, there's, there's one element, as I'm looking at the screen here, you've got the, the uh, Javelin and the B-17 mm -hmm. that I'm looking at. Is that, mm -hmm. is that yeah, that's, it. Right that's correct, yes. Okay. And um, there's something I want to interject into the conversation here because this is the fundamental basis for every single model box stop that you're ever going to see. You ready? Yeah. The three elements of composition are vertical, horizontal, and diagonal. Vertical is strength and power. Think of a missile launch, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Horizontal is flaccid, peaceful, restful, like an airliner in cruise. Mm -hmm. Diagonal is action. And both of these are diagonal pictures. How about that? Okay. That, I was about to say, that B-17 going horizontal is anything but flaccid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got you know, B-17s dive bombing like an SBD Dauntless in Midway. That's a whole other story. <laughs> but... Point being, that, um, when you look at these, uh, you know, airplanes that are crowding the box and exploding off the box, um, they're, they're usually banking, turning, climbing, diving, doing something very dynamic in terms of energy, and that translates into the excitement of the artwork. Oh my gosh, you just tapped on something. That, that, yeah. that I thought that I just actually had a quasi-original thought, which is a dangerous thing. Um, everybody, most people, not everybody, but a, I would say. Roughly, based on my experience, 80% of modelers, 85, prefer box art to photos of a built model. Some like to see the built model so they know what they're buying. I get it. that, that right. perfectly. But it just dawned on me, when you take a photograph of a model sitting on a table, there is no way to insert any action. Which Good point. You, but you're sitting on the gear. You nailed it. That's yeah. exactly right. And whereas you can, you know, because most of the both of these, at like most box art, as we've said before, they're telling you a story. You know, mm -hmm. you, you can feel the guys in that B-17, you know, just nerve-wrackingly wanting to drop those bombs and get head for home. And you look at that uh, javelin, and you know that pilot's just having the time of his life. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I thought we'd talk... Hey. Hmm? What? Did, did no. these guys ever collaborate or meet? I don't know. <clears throat> um, Let yes. me know. Yes, when we began the... Uh, uh, American Society of Aviation Artists in 1986. Um, we had uh, Joe Catula, uh, myself, um, Ferris McCall, R.G. Smith, all uh, together uh, 
at this uh, launching of the uh, organization, and it was a, it was an amazing uh, meeting of the minds, I guess. Uh, not all were box, art, box artists. Joe Catullo did the Aurora covers mm-hmm. and model airplane news, if you're familiar with those. Mm-hmm. And he was at that time uh, in his, I guess, early 70s, he was the elder statesman of our uh, beloved industry at that point. And uh, gave me a critique on an A1 Sky Raider painting that I had that uh, I remember to this day. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, in terms of collaboration on work, no, nobody ever painted on anyone else's work. I can tell you that. But we, it was a, it was a brotherhood. It really was. It was a, it was a family. It was a very tight knit group of people who competed for business and yet were the best of friends. It all sounds like Murderer's Row of artists. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. They, 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 somebody joked at the banquet. Uh, at uh, we met at um, a University of Virginia in Charlottesville to, to launch the uh, organization, and somebody joked at the banquet that if anybody dropped a bomb on that building, it would have been the end of aviation art in this country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably true. Yeah. Hey, hey. By the way, that that uh, another question just popped up. Uh, I know Jack taught at art school. Uh, you you studied under him, I think, right? I worked with him. He, stu- he uh, taught at Art Center. I was a graduate at Cal State Long Beach. But oh, yes, okay. he was a professor at Art Center, uh, um, College of Design. You don't have to know if Roy Cross or any of the other artists were also uh, teachers. I, I do not know that. No, oh, I Okay. Don't. I was just curious, uh, you know, because uh, I, I, everything I've always heard from, because when I did the bio on, on Jack uh, for my channel, I got a lot of feedback. Yeah. People said it. they studied under him, and some of them had some pretty lengthy stories. Uh, and, um, there was, I mean, you could feel the respect for the man. There was no, uh, oh, he was a mean guy or, oh, God, I've, you know, he was, they all really, 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 uh, thought just the world of him. Yeah, listen, I, I know, uh, we're kind of late at night in Europe. I don't want to take up too much time, but I'd love to share a quick story on Lenwood. Go Actually, for it. I watched him paint a cover. <laughs> can I, can I share that? Mm. Oh. Please, yeah, before that's that's good. I met him at, at Art Center, and I knew him through the Society of Illustrators, and uh, he didn't know me real well at the time. We later became very, very close friends, but um, uh, he was uh, teaching a class in illustration, and um, up on the, leaning against the chalkboard, on the shelf of the chalkboard, was the first original I ever saw of his work, and it was the Hueys uh, unloading the troops into the rice paddies in Nam. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're looking at the right side of the helicopter. It's it's just hovering, and they're leaping out into the swamp. You probably know that. Image. Yep, I do. And the thing that struck me is how small it was. Uh huh. You know, the box was 12 inches long. The illustration was probably 15 inches long. Huh. It, it was it was small. It wasn't a big painting. It was reduced down. It was up. Uh, used to say 120 percent up uh, to keep the uh, the uh, tightness. But he was giving a demonstration, and he's, he's, he's in a, a white shirt and black tie, uh, you know, the, the teacher, and he's giving a, a demonstration on painting the tire of a, a 18-wheeler, a Fruhoff truck. Mm-hmm. And it's in a, a, you know, it's a classic Lenwood composition, and, uh, you know, it's like at night with the floodlights and the whole, you can just imagine it. I don't think it was a Ravel cover, but it was a, an illustration of a, of a Fruhoff 18-wheeler uh, with the front tire turned toward you okay mm-hmm. so you're looking edge on at the tire tread mm-hmm. and he's sitting there and there's a class of about maybe eight or ten guys and they're all just in you know in enraptured and in, in certainly around him as he's painting and he takes a triple odd brush which was a triple odd uh brush which is a, a super detailed brush like for panel lines on a fuselage mm-hmm super small, like maybe 12 hairs or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he takes a triple odd brush, he holds his right wrist with his left hand, and he lays in serrated tire tread on the tire. And the top of the tire is lit, and it goes into shadow, and he starts laying this in, and you you can hear a pin drop in that room. (laughs) And I know this is a family show, it was freaking perfect. And, and we were just in. I remember looking over somebody's shoulders, going, "You got to be kidding me!" And it was just, it was. But there he was, the master. Was like, we were like watching Michelangelo chisel David in front of you, you know. Well, uh, that, that's am- it. It is. The troopers has a, has a question. I, I, I was just reading that. If either one of you know who did the B-17 mural at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in DC, Mike and I were just lamenting this recently. Mike, I'm going to let you tell the story. Yeah, that's Keith Ferris. That's, yeah, okay. that, that's 
master, we consider that the uh, Sistine Chapel of Aviation Art. That's the uh, the Thunderbird, which is a, a, a depiction of an actual mission of a B-17 over Germany, correct down to the markings on the ME-109s that are attacking the formation. Even, um, the, even the faces are correct. Yeah, the, the, those are portraits of the crewmen, even behind the masks. And uh, the, the widow of one of them actually recognized her husband in the, in the painting when she saw the mural. Oh, wow. But yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, his, that's his masterpiece. Uh, not, not to go negative, because this is a happy channel, but there is a considerable concern about the fate of that painting. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that it was, uh, it, is, it, is, it has been taken down somehow, and I'm hoping it's for the refurbishment of that building and not that it's not permanent. Do you know if that was on I canvas think, or painted right on the wall? Yeah, I, I'm not, I, I heard it was taken down in sections. I don't know the details, but I'm hoping it was just because they're refurbishing that building, which is being literally rebuilt. It was, it was opened in 1976. Yeah. So I, I was I, there I for that opening. Really? You were there? Not that day, but not not on that particular day, but very shortly after. We actually went down to see it uh, just before it opened. I used to work in Roslyn, which was a short um, ride by subway train, um, not too far from there. Oh, great. Oh. Hey, we used to go down there for lunch every once in a while. No, it's bad. Well, well, now, you, oh, you bet. <laughs> uh, be be oh, before I run off on the next thing I want to ask, I did want to ask about these two pictures, which I picked on purpose, uh, mm -hmm. since they're both American bombers and, uh, you know, in sort of similar situations. Mike, I, I, this, this is for you because this is, about, this is about technique. If you could talk about the technique of the two artists, you know, because they're both excellent paintings, but they seem to have, a, for lack of a better word, a different maybe style. Again, I, I never met Roy Cross. I'm a huge uh, fan of his work. And um, I would just say from, from the 30,000-foot view, the, the, the big-picture view is that uh, European artists have uh, a different coloration, different palette in their work because mm -hmm. the lighting is different in Europe. I remember my first trip to Paris, first trip to London. I'd look at the sky, and I remember thinking to myself, in, in, uh, in England in particular, that sky looks just like a Frank Wooten painting. Mm -hmm. It had the coloration of a Frank Wooten <laughs> painting. It looked different. And even in the U.S., the East Coast artists have a different look. West Coast artists have a different look. Again, because the sky and the atmosphere is so different, the coloration is different. My work changed. I was born and raised in New York uh, and, uh, and wound up living on the West Coast, and my work changed as a result of that. So um, the, the big picture is that in Europe, there's a different sense of coloration uh, all the greats, Frank Wooten, Robert Taylor, uh, Roy, any of the greats uh, have a, a look to their work that uh, bespeaks their locale. So I'll start with that. Okay. Um, the second would be uh, just the, the approach to the airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at Roy's B-26, that's a more literal uh, rendition of the airplane than, than Lenwood's uh, B-17. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm not quite sure where to go on this. I mean, they're both technically accurate. They're both uh, in action and, and uh, you know, the, in, the, in the heat of war. Uh, they're both beautiful illustrations. They're just very different in look. Well, I will I will give my uh, model, kit model buyer point of view here. You know, total, know nothing of art, but do know what I like to buy. And sure. I, I have to, now I have to make a confession first. Uh, and Mike, you already know this. I have some of Linwood's uh, comps. Uh, they're those in the Era Commander painting are the are the pride possessions of my life, and I I I, I have a, a built-in bias towards Jack's work because it's the work of my childhood. Okay, uh, and that's not to take anything away from Roy because his work is absolutely stellar. Um, but uh, having said that, if I was a kid, and assuming I wasn't particular about what kid I was getting, just looking at the two of them. I think Jack's, like, you know, I guess it's the cramming the boxing, but Jack's seems to leap out at me more. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's another angle, and I don't know, uh, again, I, my apologies uh, for our uh, English blue troopers that are watching. I don't know if Roy was a pilot or if he flew, but I can tell you that uh, a lot of what you see in Jack's work or what you feel in Jack's work results from the fact that he was a pilot he was a civilian instructor during World War II. His favorite airplane in the world was a B-38. 
and uh, he was an airplane owner. His first airplane that he bought, I hope everybody's sitting down for this, a North American T-6 surplus at the end of the war, he paid $800. Yeah, them days are gone. <laughs> and and oh. that, was first, that was his first airplane. And God love him, he flew uh, up until his uh, later years. He, uh, he moved from California to Arizona uh, after retiring, and he flew an ultralight. Uh, and in his 70s so uh, he was a, he was a pilot and he, he knew his way around airplanes uh, when he painted uh, crew members in the airplane they were the body language was correct you'd see guys leading into the turn um, you familiar with the uh, Boeing K-Dead Ravel model the silver one yeah Banking? yeah yeah take a look at that the student is sitting rigid upright in the front cockpit probably ready to lose his lunch and the instructor in the back cockpit is leaning into the turn. It's just a subtle little Jack Lenwoodism that's so perfect, but he knew his way around airplanes. Well, being a flight instructor in the war, that was that was especially in his wheelhouse because uh, you know he, he probably saw plenty of students who were just like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. And, One uh, of the things that I noticed, if I can make a comment, yeah, um, uh, the Jack Lenwood picture i mean there's nothing wrong with with, uh, with the other picture it's very very clean very precise jacks almost looks like the airplane is vibrating <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I, I know what you mean you kind of get that subtle difference between the two uh, uh it, it, it does have that i don't want to use the word blurry but uh you 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 sort of um uh you sense that it's in motion. Yeah. And uh, that was one yeah, of the things. Jack's, huh? Jack's work draws you in. It really does. Um, and, I, I, and now, you got to understand, except for the P-47 uh, on the lower right, uh, we had every one of these box arts in our house growing up. Remember, there were my older brother's models. And, uh, in fact, okay, Blue Troopers, here's something. We always talk about how models educate. I'd never heard of the Illusion Tigers until I saw this kit. And I went, what is with that goofy looking tiger mouth on it? And my brother says, that's the uh, Illusion Tigers. And I go, what are they? And we, of course, the instruction sheet told you because you got the famous flying tigers down below it, which everybody knew. And uh, I turned, you know, Claire, uh, Claire Chenault's son was an Illusion Tiger. And uh, uh, they didn't see that much combat because there wasn't that much going on in the Illusions, but there were, there was battle up there and, you see, you know, he just flamed a roof. And by the way, side note, this came up in a previous live stream. The pinkish color of that roof is accurate. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one thing I just noticed when I was putting this together, because you're always thinking about Jack's cheats, right? Yes. The Thunderbolt is dropping his bombs on the climb. <laughs> You, uh, you caught that, did you? And I'm thinking, well, maybe his bomb shackle's hooked up, or he's he's dropping after the wingman got behind. He's some young second lieutenant or something, you know. But I was like, hey, he's dropping his bombs on the climb, and he's still got his belly tank. The other guy behind yeah, him is you know, clean. The, the, the wingman's bombs are long gone, right? And you figure, okay, the, the guy in the rear is probably the ace of the base who's taking this kid out on his first mission. <laughs> Welcome to Jack's wonderful world of, you know, Jack. I don't know how to say it. My favorite... <laughs> Go up to the one, uh, the the uh, Mustang above it. Uh huh. If that ME 163 is in the correct position for the timing of this moment that the airplanes are crossing, he just flew through the Mustang. <laughs> well, for all we know, he's missing a wingtip. <laughs> oh, real close to it. He just, he just flew right through mm -hmm. the middle of the Mustang to get to that position where he is right now. Yeah, the same on my favorite one with the Spitfire. You're like, how can that 109 be there? <laughs> yeah, notice he has the right rudder input too. Check uh -huh. that out. You know, I mean, but all that stuff, and and it goes back uh, to the comment that Jack made the very first day I met him, and we were talking about this, and he said, um, you know, I asked him these questions. I said, why did you, you know, put the guy getting into the B-58 Hustler with no ladder? Why did you <laughs> do two sun, two light sources in the C-130 cover? What? And he was amazed that I even, you know, paid attention to any of that stuff. But he, he said, where does this guy come from? Yeah, yeah and he looked at me, and, and I think I, I shared with you before the fact that I saved every one of his covers. I had them under my arm, mm -hmm. uh, you know, neatly trimmed and everything. I had this stack of his covers. And 
And I showed it to him. I said, Mr. Langwood, I just want you to know I, I love your work. And I, yeah, I was doing the typical fan thing. And I, <laughs> I saved every one of your covers. And he looks at me and goes, why'd you save all that crap? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the man the man was not hung up on his own work. Yeah, but the comment was, you said, well, all those things you mentioned made you look at it, didn't it? Didn't yeah. It? I went, yeah. You well, said, did you buy the kit? Now, you see, Mike, yeah. you, because, because you've told me all this, now every time I look at box art, I start looking for that stuff. And <laughs> and it's amazing. And I just, I just found one right uh, here in front of us right now. That P-40, the Flying Tiger. Did not flame that Betty. And I can tell you how I know. Okay. Look how long the smoke trail is and look how close they are. Bingo. <laughs> In the, I mean. That thing's been be, that thing's stuff. been burning a good 30 seconds to a minute or more. You're yeah, which means. It, carrying member to the I busted Lenwood Club. <laughs> 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 the, P40, the P40 that's off screen is the one that got him. This is just a wingman following Chase. <laughs> I'm looking at the upper left. Mm -hmm. What's a float plane doing flying in the mountains? Well, that's the illusion. I'm sure there's an ocean nearby. I mean, but he's in the Alps or something. I mean, just, <laughs> I, you, you see what I'm saying? It's like a float plane. He's looking the for the lake. <laughs> oh, lake. Right now, he's okay. probably okay. wondering how did he end up here. <laughs> well, there's one other little detail on that P-47. He's that? still got his drop tank. I, I he pointed be, that out. Yeah. Flying. You write that Drop off as the new up. guy. He's the new guy. <laughs> now, uh, go, go, just looking at some more Linwood art here, I was going to point out, that, and I assume Roy Cross is the same way. Some of these are box arts, but some of them are for magazines, and, and we're going to show, show some of Jack's uh, posters later. Um, okay. Some of them are corporates, like the, I think it's the Falcon Missile, I believe. Um, and But you, I also noticed you look at the bottom at that Maya Sheshev or Bison, and and yep. you, there's your famous B58 with no ladder lower left, but it, and, and but as you go up one like to the Messerschmitt or a Bob Hoover's Rockwell, and you start to see more, I, I don't know if the word would be realism, a little less surrealism maybe because I don't think Russia's famous for orange skies unless they've already been nuked. Um, but yeah, you uh, know somebody pointed out when I did, you know it's interesting. Now, this is neat. When I did the article, I, I uh, included the Bob Hoover uh, Old Yeller Rockwell landing. Uh -huh. You know what somebody pointed out? What? When the gear's down on a Mustang, the center doors are closed. I was just wondering, shouldn't the center doors be up? Yeah, because the gear, when the gear cycles going up and down, the doors open and close. That's right. Yeah, but it looks it looks better that way. <laughs> you know, yeah. Jack wanted, he needed to have something silver in the middle of the thing, so he put it. That, that's the kind of stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah. Hey, and that, and that Russian picture, you never heard of Red Dawn? Okay. <laughs> Take that and run with it. Uh, doesn't explain the B-58. And there, top center, the Swiss Air, we have one of uh, Jack's famous kind of rainy day scenes. He, you know, he really liked the rain with airliners, and I have to admit it was an extremely effective technique. Yeah, he called that his European wet look. He had a trip to, uh, he had a trip to Europe, and uh, he said he was so taken with the lighting, he figured out a way to duplicate that if we have any artists watching uh if you know designer gouache grays are numbered in in, in from light to dark mm -hmm. so number one gray is a very it's almost off white it's a very very light gray uh -huh. and the secret to the european wet look was to use number one gray instead of white oh, okay anywhere he would do with the exception with the exception of the top of the fuselage of the 990 and that i guess gives it the overcast feel Everywhere else that you would normally do white for a, a highlight or, you know, coloration, you, you drop it down to a number one gray and suddenly it's wet and cold and mm -hmm. just has that look. He did that on, uh, I think there was a Jaguar uh, automobile uh, model kit that he, or a number of car kits that he did that also. Is that the and, red um, one that's at night? Yeah. Did he do the Rotodyne box? Yes. Yes, he did. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, here are just the big picture of the same fighters we saw earlier. By the way, uh, I just saw a Linwood painting go up for sale, and it was it might have been a red Jaguar at night, I think. And it was going for $8,500. How much? 8500 That's about right. Yeah. Um, the uh, other thing was is that, of course, Jack was still a commercial illustrator. And I try to use... 
since I've met you, Mike, I've tried to use the word illustrator. Uh, yeah. Because I think, as I recall from doing his bio, also he was very big that he's an illustrator. And, uh, yeah, yeah he, he, he did, uh, you know, ill, the, the term illustrator, uh, which, which does not apply to me because I was, you know, 90 plus percent focused on airplanes. But uh, the term illustrator means you can just do anything. Mm-hmm. And the person that comes to mind is the great Ren Wicks, who did, you, you'd know his stuff if you saw it. Um, but started uh, working for Lockheed during the war, doing uh, uh, P-38 ads and things like that. Worked for Howard Hughes doing TWA airplanes. But he could also do like a woman in a mink stole getting out of a 59 Cadillac. Right. Or food or cruise ships or you name it. He did it because he was, quote, an illustrator. They could do everything. Did, didn't Renwick's <laughs> do the uh, Constellation with the really long wings and spread out engines? That's Ren. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. I was like... God, that's an elegant-looking airplane, but something's not right. <laughs> it's a TWA motor glider, you know. It's, it's like a, it's a yeah. Well, uh, um, that, that we, picture of the car was of a Ferrari. Oh, okay. All right. Eighty-seven hundred dollars. Eighty. Yeah, oh, it's gone up. Okay. Long. Um, I, 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 you know, I have that. That's. I'm sure it's it'll get that, that. I'm just saying, it's not a large painting. It's, oh, okay. Uh, Thirteen by twenty-three, uh, seventeen by twenty-four. Wow! Oh, that... I stand corrected. Okay. Well, that right. I don't consider that very big, but yeah. It, it, but I know even uh, he also did a lot of movie posters, and um, yeah. uh, one of them that I forgot to put on here. Uh, I've seen most of these movies too. Uh, I don't think I ever saw the Bride of the Incredible Hulk, but you know what? He didn't make the movie; he just did the poster. So no matter how you know much we may laugh at the idea of the movie. He still did a great job. And he also did Jaws, too, you know, which was uh, um, actually a really big movie. But, um, and it's knockoff Great White. He did Great Lady Down. I saw that movie with Charlton Heston and Midway, which also had Charlton Heston. And, and the, uh, airport, the airport movies. Oh, okay. I didn't realize he'd done those. Well, the, the thing is, is that I realize that, you know, to him, this is just commercial. You know, but I do know that for Airport 77, the one with the 747 sinks, yeah. Uh, which had you know Jimmy Stewart and a lot a lot of big name actors and uh, Jack Lemmon. Anyway, uh, when I was doing this bio, I was reading something he wrote. He goes, he'd done the poster for that, and when he showed it to the people, they, I think they wanted it facing the other direction, or I forget what it was, but they had some issues with it or some changes they wanted made, and um, it was easier for him. And he did it in one night, just pulled an all nighter. Yeah. He completely redid the poster in twenty four hours. Because it was easier than trying to change, you know, undo and then redo, just to start from right. scratch. And I meant to put that poster up here, but it's on. We've all seen it with the sunken seven forty seven. And I have got to tell you, that poster made me want to go see the movie. I mean, it was terrifying to look at. Um, so uh, very effective, just like his box art. And I, I uh, was just amazed. He, he could crank that out faster than I can sketch a picture of a seven four. Um, yeah, and, and to that point, Max, uh, I forgot to mention uh, when we were back when we were talking about the model box tops. Those were all done in a day. Every one of those covers was a day. Good Lord, the man was fast. We did like yeah, six hundred and fifty uh, of them in his career. Run on the beach, have a good breakfast, and start painting, and then it would be done probably around midnight or something like that. And the reason for that, as he explained it, was that he it kept all the colors matching correctly. In other words, when you're working in water based paint, you work for a day. I used to do this at Douglas. I'd paint for a day, go home, come back, remix the same colors. And you'd get it close, but Jack being Jack, he wanted it perfect. So he would mix the initial color palette and use that all the way to the end of the painting in a, in a 12 to 18 hour sprint. You know. Huh. Well, he also did uh, life, real life art, uh, the, the Japanese pearl divers. I know he did yes. some paintings. These are just some things I found online to put in here. And I didn't yep. realize when I was putting it together that I've got the shark going after the pearl divers. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, that was a oopsie. But um, the uh, it, it just an incredibly well-rounded artist. And from what I've heard, a very good person. Just you know, someone you like to learn from, hang out with, and uh, and being an aviation fanatic myself, I completely appreciate his love of aviation. Um, yeah, just as a fo- uh, to that point, uh, just as a footnote, um, he was a talented musician. He played uh, saxophone, uh, keyboard, and oh. uh, I believe saxophone. He played a number of different instruments, and he was a car collector. Ferraris, wasn't it? Uh, no, he had uh, two XKEs. 
Oh, the Jaguars. That was. I, mean, I knew it was a foreign yeah, card. Yeah. Well, foreign. Yeah, they called him the twelve cylinder, the long nose. In fact, and, uh, he was just a very you know Renaissance man, just and a pilot yes. and just a multi talented guy. Uh, wicked sense of humor, uh, just a lovely, lovely man. I can't say enough. I was honored to know him. I, I, I now that you mentioned that, I remember when I did the bio on him that at one point he, he didn't know if he wanted to be a pilot or a musician, because apparently he was good enough. Because I knew he was a child actor, and uh, really, I mean, of course, I wonder how. Much, now, don't get me wrong, Jack clearly had truckloads of raw talent, but I wonder how much of that was uh, realized because he was from California. You know Hollywood in that area where an artist sure. can be appreciated. You know if he if he'd grown up in you know some town like I did, I, I mean he probably would have risen out of it anyway. But uh, um, no, it, it, you you make an excellent point. He flew at a at a, a Culver Field, which is a, a, a doesn't exist anymore. It was kind of near where the Hughes facility is that we drove around that time when you were out here. Um, he flew. He learned to fly there uh, in his teens. And so you had the entertainment industry, you had aviation, there was a lot, yeah, the music, uh, there was a lot of that stuff in town that, that might've been very much a factor. Yeah. Uh, in fact, let's, uh, two questions coming your way, Mike. Uh, one from Nathan is, uh, uh, he says, my question, Mike saying that, uh, uh, could do in the form of art and graphics. And does he think there's a future for illustrators in the future with the fact that we now have AI generated art? We don't have enough time to get into that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Holy cow. Wow. I, I have a lot of issues with AI-generated art, so it's going to be yeah, a long a, time for writing. By the way, I see a, a question there which I can answer really quick. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Mike ever used an airbrush. I've never touched an airbrush in my life. Not even on your kit models? No, uh, I'm a spray can guy. Sorry. Don't oh. kill me. Okay. <laughs> don't kill me. I'm a rattle No, I was just rattle around. canning out in the Tarbus a little while ago, and... We're going to get into that later, maybe. I know Steve's dying for me to tell the story because he heard it yeah. live on the phone. Um, yeah, but, but no, uh, you know, I, I, in all seriousness, I've, never, I've just never used it. I've learned how to uh, create skies and washes and everything that look like airbrush, and many people, I've seen it in comments all over the place, many people think I, I'm an airbrush artist. I've never touched one. Interesting. Sorry. Well, the bird crazy's got an uh, interesting question. So, yeah. He said, uh, I would like to hear... Mike's opinion on present day digital art, which is usually a 3D render with uh, overpaint, like Airfix. Yeah. Um, uh, if I may. Yeah. I go look for at it. that. I look at that the way uh, Max, your your uh, cockpit and, and the A320 is, mm -hmm. is compared to what you learned to fly in the Luscombe. I understand exactly what you mean. I'm I'm in awe of the stuff that comes out. I've dabbled in it. I work in Photoshop and Illustrator. I I do. I, you know I. I dip my toe into that world occasionally, but uh, I am just awestruck with how stunning the the, uh, the graphics are. And I'll tell you what, there was a there was an epiphany. It's a great question, thank you. There's an, there was an epiphany moment for me on graphic art. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, similar to what you see in the movies when you go to a movie. And you, you know, I remember seeing Titanic, and and just sitting there going, I never knew they had black and white footage of the things sailing. You know, it was that convincing. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was that convincing. But I was reading Aviation Week. And I see a picture of an A320, I'm sorry, the Jumbo, the A380, taking off from Toulouse. Uh -huh. The airplane hadn't flown yet, it was about a year away from flying. And it, I'm looking at this image, and it's like, holy, the shadow and the lighting. Went, wow, I didn't know they flew it. They got me. It was digital art. That, went, that's oh, what's got a lot of people I, worried about, about deep fakery and stuff like that, because of what we can do with a lot of this stuff. Yeah, so I, you know, they got me, and but I, I have to tell you, and and a hundred, you know, in every sense of the word, my honest feeling is that it's just fantastic stuff. It's done with different tools. The connection is the same fundamentals for design and lighting and everything else. But it's, I, I think it's stunning. I think it's fantastic. They're just using electrons instead of brushes, the computer yeah. instead of canvas. Painting with painting with pixels, as I call it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the, the well, now we're gonna talk about Roy. Now, I don't. I, although I did do a bio on Roy Cross, I don't have a lot of uh, personal information or know anything about him. Uh, the few folks who said they've met him, apparently a very personable guy. And uh, very, of course, obviously, you, you know, Mike, you and I sometimes refer to him as the, as the British Jack Linwood. Um, yep. I don't know if he worked as fast as Jack did, but uh, a lot of his artwork, I, I remember being very, very impressed with it, especially when he would have you... He was one of the few guys that made some bomber art of like short sterlings 
and the like in Lancasters on the ground, but you're looking up at them. And they had this regalness or majesticness to them, and I forgot to get the picture. <laughs> Although you can see, the, you can see to the, the left side there, there's one of them that he repainted coming in with a flaming engine. But that angle, I thought, was very good for that airplane. Um, but, uh, he, uh, you know, I, I, I see a lot of, uh, I don't know if you call them Linwoodisms, but I look at his art and I, I see a, a sort of a, I don't want to use the word similarity. That's not right. Um, it, it's, it's like he and Jack both understood angles. Uh, you notice all of these airplanes are in a bank because they're all action scenes like you were referring to earlier. They're all diagonal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think those two, probably, if each one of them wrote a book, they, there would be a lot of overlap between the two of them. Um, and I just noticed that that uh, wimpy, that Wellington's got an engine smoke and it's feathering the prop. Yeah. Although one of them looks like it might be bent. <laughs> uh, how low was he flying? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. These are superb images, and the Dauntless, uh, being a Douglas guy, of course, but the Dauntless uh, is the one that really... Uh, attracts my eye and gets my attention but they all have if i may mm -hmm. um they all have uh the, the elements of the six basic things that you want in a good successful composition which is a combination of cool and warm colors mm -hmm. the bi you know the world war uh one uh, biplanes mm -hmm. uh, cool and warm colors light and dark shape uh, the bomber at the uh, lower right and uh bright and dull shiny surfaces versus dull like the dauntless in the background and every one of those things just screams with those uh, six elements, and that's what uh, makes them successful. They're they're just stunning. But the thing I notice, I'll say this, and I'll let you move on with the conversation. But I, the thing I notice is that we're further away from the airplanes than Jack than we were with Jack's work. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Jack's airplanes tend to be just in your face. They're about to smash through the window mm -hmm. at you. You know, they're, they're coming right at you. These take a step back to let you enjoy more of the total shape of the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's just the same image with Roy standing beside it. I, pre I prep all the stuff ahead of time, but sometimes I wind up with a little redundancy. Uh, here's a little more of his artwork, and um, it'll, it'll be about 20 seconds before you guys see it. But um, I noticed that, uh, uh, like Jack, he does cars and rockets and other things, uh, mm -hmm. you know, ships and stuff, uh, land vehicles. But uh, aircraft seem to be, both he and Jack seem to be more aircraft than anything else, at least that I found. And, oh, wow. Uh, um, I imagine those two would have, uh, would have had a great time chatting with each other. But um, the, uh, the, like you say, as I look at his, I see what you're talking about. You're further back. Um, the, 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 OS2U Kingfisher's a little bit and the Saturn V are a little bit in your face, but the others are more like mm -hmm. scenes, you know, yeah, and uh, you see the entire thing. Although I don't... I don't I mean, hmm? yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I don't know where you were talking about Jack with the Fruhoff. I don't, I don't know if he used the same cram the box with the uh, land vehicles as he did with the aircraft, or... No, that's, a, that's an excellent point. The cars were more scenic. You know, uh, pulling up in front of a mansion or pulling up in front of the club or, you know, the, on the racetrack or something like that. Mm -hmm. Cars are more literal. Uh, and I think that's because they wanted to show you the whole machine. Um, so that's a, that's a good point. Ships were the same way. Ships were, you saw the entire machine. Airplanes yeah. were kind of in a, a class by themselves. Uh, I got to tell you, by the way, that Hover Lloyd, the hovercraft in yeah. the upper uh, right. Uh -huh. I remember seeing that kid at Pope's Hobby Shop in New York and it just, my knees buckled. I, I thought that was the coolest thing I ever saw. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous piece of artwork. And he, the machine itself was very, very futuristic, you know. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was, well, you knew it was cool because they were using them in James Bond movies. And it was in a James yeah, Bond movie. Had to be the latest, coolest thing. Um, yeah. But uh, the, the one thing that I find interesting is that kind of breaking the rules we were talking about is the World War One dogfight. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you literally have an almost perfect profile view of the camel and an almost perfect top view of the albatross. Um, yeah. not, not the kind of angles we were talking Well, it is, it is one's diving and one's climbing. So I guess there is still diagonal. Um, yeah. but, uh, kind of interesting. I mean, it's a great, I mean, I wouldn't mind having that hanging on my wall, but, uh, uh but, but it's, uh, seems to be a little different. A lot of them where you usually see the airplane at some sort of angle. I can understand yeah. the Kingfisher being just shot off the, the, 
the catapult because it's an observation plane, you know, that's not, <laughs> you know, not a whole lot you can do with that, but, uh, um, yeah, but it, it's, it's very effective. And the fact that there's a ship at the upper left and lower right, mm -hmm. it's a really nice compositional balance. But going back to the World War One scene, there's something else very, very cool that's happening there. Mm. You ready? Yeah. Just take a, an overall look, just glance at the whole thing. The smoke is making your eye move in a circle all the way around the composition. Oh, okay. Yeah, the smoke is guiding your eye from the, uh, you know, it, you're literally moving in a, in a clockwise rotation all the way through the art. Very effective. The one thing I notice about that DUKW at the top mm -hmm. is, although all these are great artwork, it, 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 the J-52s down at the bottom are telling a bit of a story. But that one at the top, you know the story already just looking at that picture because you see the ships, the LSTs and everything, and the Liberty ships in the background. You see the beach. You know you know what this is. You don't even have to be told. Mm -hmm. And uh, the... Uh, uh, it's just, it's all, and, and I'm assuming that the J-52 is at the bottom. I'm guessing that's the invasion of Crete. But uh, it's, but, but, but there's just, there, it, Roy seems to be a little more specific about a particular point in history. Mm -hmm. And, or at least that's. Yeah, he's, he's telling a very specific story, not just a moment in time. Right. And, and that's, uh, but these guys are, uh, I mean, there's a reason that people, you know, write books and articles about them because. You know, and and they're not the only one. There are other great artists. I, we had we had one of Frank Wooten's books, uh, and it's funny you should mention that because my brother had it, has it, and it was in our house. And I remember flipping through it. And one thing I, it's exactly what you know. I mean, I'm like 14 years old when I'm looking at this thing. I'm going, I'm looking at the clouds, which are always very present in his pictures, and, and especially one of the Bach lightnings. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, the skies are just beautiful. And yeah. for, for, for ever since this, I was probably 15, 16 years old, I would look up and say, oh, that reminds me of a Frank Wooten sky. And I started going, I had these beautiful billowing clouds of the sun strike. I call it, a, with the gray under, but I call it a Wooten sky. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, and as I said, I saw them in England. Um, by the way, Nathan Bond is asking what illustrator did the model airplane news covers. And again, that was Joe Catula. Did those in, and those were watercolor, if you can believe it. And I he think did, I did a bio on Joe out on my channel somewhere. So there's, um, yeah. and he was uh, uh, up in Pennsylvania, I think. But uh, yeah, he, he worked for Piper of all things. He did all the Piper. That animals. was it. He did all the Piper, Piper stuff. I was trying something back and back, yeah. and my brain was clicking. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, and I don't. I assume Roy's retired now, but uh, um, you, you, part of me and, and you're the perfect person to ask about this. I know everyone has a different talent level, but I'm assuming that in the case of both Roy and Jack, they didn't just grow up being able to do this, that they had to master their skill over time. Sure. Um, the, uh, I don't know. Uh, you say Jack does them in a day. I, I have no idea how fast Roy would do one, but uh, Roy, now, the well, of course, I'm only comparing two pictures here, but... Uh, but Jack also, uh, going back to another picture, let me throw the movie posters back up real, real quick. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I don't have enough of the sampling of Roy's work to, to make this comparison. But one thing I do notice is that Jack has some very different styles. I mean, these aren't all one style. Uh, mm -hmm. The lady in, in the bottom center, the uh, pearl diver in the bottom center, looks almost more like a, uh, I, I, it may have, I don't know if you guys have got it up on your screen yet or not, that looks almost more like a like a pencil drawing or something than or I mean I have no idea what it would use but um, whereas the one I'm on the beach the colors seem to be a little more literal. Um, uh, a lot of that is the, the time that he did it. In other words, there's work that he did in the early '50s that looks very very different than the work he did in the '70s. Right. Uh, the mm -hmm. pearl diver at lower center is done in what they call a sepia wash. It's like an ink mm -hmm. uh, or it's, it's a, you know monochromatic out of a tube water based. Uh, and then, uh, guys, look at the value range, you know, from the drapery on, the, on her uh, blouse to the, to the detail in her face and the hair and everything. It's quite a, quite a leap in terms of value, mm -hmm. uh, the intensity of the color. Uh, but that, that, to me, looks like his earlier works in the uh, even late 40s, early 50s, and then his later stuff. Um, you know, it, it, there is a difference in, in what it looked like. And I was just thinking that Jack apparently had more than one style, I guess, is what I'm look at it look getting to but 
Um, of course, I'm not enough of an artist to tell. I realize movie posters and, and model box art are made with a specific agenda in mind to get people into the theater or to get people to buy the model. Whereas, yeah, I, there's, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, there, there's one other element, and it really needs to be mentioned, mm -hmm. okay? The movie posters and even the model box art uh, were art-directed. Right, right. Okay, it wasn't Jack, it wasn't Jack sitting down going, gee, I wonder what I'm going to do. I'll make it look pretty. I'll just do it this way. He was told what to do and where everything was going to go, uh, mainly where the type was going to go on a movie poster, so he'd design it to allow space for where the copy was going to go and the titles and everything else. But he told me stories. Of working with uh, Lou Glazer, mm -hmm. President Ravel, who wanted certain covers a certain way or not a certain way, uh, and uh, uh, you know that was a, a, a pretty good part of the conversation. Is some of the stuff that he had to acquiesce where he thought it would look better, and then he was told, "No, they, they're going to go a different direction." Yeah, didn't Lou tell him something about the naval aircraft couldn't be in combat or something like that? Or and there's a number of stories, but. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I just wanted to make the point that it's not the artist, uh, and I, I've been through this, you know, if I had a dollar for every time an art director told me to change something, um, you know, it, it just, it's, there's a, uh, look, it's like being, it's like an actor or actress being directed in a movie. Uh -huh. uh, any number of things, air traffic controller telling you where to land your Airbus, you know, it, it, it's, you are being guided and directed through the process. You are the prime producer or artist. And, and someone is telling you how they want something. Mm -hmm. So I, that's a big part of what you're seeing in these movie posters. That's all. Well, my understanding is that uh, at one point, um, and I, I don't think it was uh, just a British thing. I think it happened here in the U.S. also, mm -hmm. that the uh, artists were being told they didn't want any guns firing. They didn't want any flames. Mm -hmm. So uh, ones like that, I, I think that Lancaster to the left of Roy, I think he had to go back and like unfeather the prop, Dallas the fire, and have it landing on all four. Okay. Um, sure. so, so I think that possible. was the one. But, uh, and that came apparently from on high, you know. I, I don't even think the art, I think the art director got his mar marching orders from somebody. Which uh, brings us sort of a quasi dovetail into the uh, next thing I was going to talk about. Which, uh, Mike, I believe you gave uh, this little uh, attacker, the little uh, uh, from Frog. And uh, I, I just grabbed this off the shelf. I usually just keep it on as a display. And I'd say, you know, I'm not going to build this because I just watched a video and I forgot who the other YouTuber was. He's a British chap who, who did one about kits that you probably shouldn't build. Either they're not worth it or... They might be too valuable. And I, I look at this. This box is, is in good shape and everything, and the kit's complete. And going to be totally honest, not a huge fan of the attacker as an airplane, so not dying to have one on the shelf. Uh, but I love the I love having it here in the box. And, no, I mean, it's, it's got the old brown rusted tape on the back and everything, and, and I can smell about 1961. And uh, I was just thinking, you know, a lot of us probably have a couple of kits in our stash that maybe we'd be better off not building. And But everybody's got to have their standard. Now, until not that long ago, if it came across my desk, it was going on the build queue. And I think the first one that I set aside was when Steve told me not to build that Ravel El Camino, which when I looked at it, I wasn't too thrilled about taking it on because it's kind of you got to glue the sides on. They're a trick to build. But it's electric, and it's got the little motor and everything. And apparently those things are kind of rare. And it brings up the, the question of when maybe you should not build a kit. And I know uh, I know you and some of your friends have collections of kits that they'll probably never see a tube of glue. And probably never should. Um, but it brings up the question of where to draw the line on that. And... Uh, I, I know everybody's got their own their own sliding scale, but since a lot of these kits are, are never going back into production or some of them are, you know, just in such good shape and still in the box, to, to build them, it, it almost feels like a crime against history. Uh, like taking a Viking axe out of a museum to go chop wood. <laughs> it's a good visual. Thus, thus why I did that uh, parody song, thanks to... 
Daryl to Dreamberry 2, repops will do you, you know, because somebody goes, hey, here's an original Batman bat plane. I'm like, you know what? I'll build the $20 Polar Lights kit. I'm putting this $800 original, you know, under glass. <laughs> Well, you, you, you just hit on the main point. I was thinking before Atlantis Models in Deer Park, Long Island, God bless them, uh, you'd have a Ravel kit that you would never, ever, ever touch. Uh, we're not going to get into the fact that the decals would disintegrate if you did. That's mm -hmm. a whole other separate issue. But along comes companies like Atlantis or Glencoe, when they were happening, uh, that are bringing you the models uh, that in their original form were worth hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for a gift set or something like that. And yet you've got decals that work, and you can put it together, and it looks pretty darn, you know, from five feet away, it, it looks just like the real, the original. And uh, that's that's called a win-win. That's best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny you bring up gift sets. Uh-oh. And now, that's a discussion that we've had many times over there. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that the retail to do one of the gift sets that were done in the 50s mm -hmm. just doesn't work. It's just too high priced a kit, mm -hmm. and and that's the problem. Is you know, the price of everything, even you know, on repops, if you bundle enough of them together, it turns into a very expensive kit. Yeah, and believe it or not, Steve, that was the that was the dynamic that affected and impacted the sales of the originals because they were not yeah. big sellers; they just weren't. Yeah. No, and and you know, I mean, you know, I know you often refer to that F one hundred two kit. You know that broke the what was it three ninety eight barrier? Yeah, it was two ninety eight for the yeah. uh, with the ground equipment and one ninety eight right. for the plane. Yeah, I mean I lusted after that kit when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, and I mean I just could never put enough money together. I mean there weren't that many empty Coke bottles to return. Mm -hmm. You know <laughs> to get enough money to buy it. Yeah, and but, I think yeah. Jackson and I discussed the fact that Ravel was actually competing for the companies that would do that. We're competing against themselves. Against themselves, yeah. Because for for two ninety eight, you could have three ninety eight cent models. That's kids, yeah. Yeah. So uh, all the all the above, but the gift sets were some of them just bombed, which is great for collectors because here they are all these years later, untouched. You know, with the cardboard inserts inside the boxes and everything, and it's going for a nice measly oh twelve hundred and fifty dollars on eBay. You know. Yeah. Again, back to the so, kid I'll never build. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, it's uh, it's funny you should mention. I, I did I did I get the picture here? I, I know I just downloaded it. Um, you were talking about that F one hundred two, and I, okay, let me see the one. Okay, I could have swore I just downloaded that picture. Anyway, I think everybody knows the. Oh, it's okay. Hold on, something didn't cancel. All right, let me try this again. File, paste. Prop. Oh, there you go. Hold on. By the way, uh, while I'm doing this, I want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Scalemates and Old Model Kits, but, uh, the website, because they let me they let me use their pictures. Um, and uh, that this would be a uh, <laughs> this wouldn't be much of a show without them. Uh, here we go. Okay, let me just uh, stick that photo in here. No, but, you know, the, the biggest problem with the old kits is, you know, the decals are always shot. Yeah. Now, if you wanted to build it, as soon as you put the decal in water, it disintegrates. Okay, here, uh, yeah. you guys will see it in about 20 seconds, but I got a picture up of that Ravel kit. Now, now, Mike, this is going to be, because I know you... you, you we're around you, you. I mean, you, you and I actually went to where Ravel factory used to be. Uh, but Steve, yeah. you're a marketing guy, so this is really to anybody. Uh, I think, it, which is why you don't want to go into business with me. I think this <laughs> kit was a brilliant <laughs> idea, but you say it flopped, which is, I think, a tragedy. And I understand why, because we all know three dollars was a lot of money back then. But. Mm -hmm. With all that ground equipment and everything, there is no way if I had the means as a kid, I could not have not bought that, even if I didn't care for the airplane. Just mm -hmm. all the cool stuff, the value-added stuff that came with it. Um, yep. Now, I'll bet you that would do well today. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, I don't know. To me, this is, uh, 
this is kind of, it, in a way, it, it's both the high point and the low point at Rebel. I mean, low point on sales, but high point, and I don't know if they ever really made anything cooler than this. Yeah, that's a perfect point. And to go back to something you just said a minute ago, or a moment ago, is the fact that technology of model building was different in those days. Mm -hmm. You know, when you say a kit like this today, even if it was like 40, 50, 60 bucks, uh, you know, think of the trumpeter big ones, they're over 100. Mm -hmm. um, the technology of how you build a model, how you paint it, the metal work, uh, so many different aspects, uh, is so different. It's light years from what the time was when this kid was kid was out. And um, uh, the other thing I remember, I remember when I first saw this kid in, in, in Hobby Rama on Sunrise Highway in Rockville Center, New York, plug. Um, <laughs> the it was so, uh, what was the word, bombastic? I mean, it was, yeah. when I opened the box, it was like, how it got, who, there's 8,000 people. <laughs> How the heck are we ever going to build this? And the, the, the plastic was, I don't want to say rubbery, it had a different consistency than the 98 cent kits. It had a different feel, a different look. Uh, it just was different. And the engineering, I, I agree with you, this is the apex, this is the epitome of Ravel's engineering, because if you ever had this, when you open the canopy, the gear extended. When you closed oh. the canopy, the gear retracted. Oh. You, had to build, you had to build all that linkage, and it was all engineered into the kit. And um, if you saw, uh, you know, Max had discussed it earlier. I had a video on it on my YouTube channel. The Ryan X13 was supposed to be the next one. I want it, them to find those molds. <laughs> and, yeah, that was going to be the, the Ryan X13 on the truck. was going to be the next kit in this series, 298. Uh, one thirty second scale X thirteen with fully operating everything, and um, and then uh, they they canceled it based on the uh, you know palm tree sales of this particular kit, and then they went to the one ninety eight version with just the airplane, and what? that all happened in that nineteen fifty seven fifty eight a day of Ravel uh, being the king of the hill at that time. You also have to remember at that time in the country there was a huge recession that hit. People all, forget all that. Above, man. Yeah, because it, it all connects. Yeah, they, and because that's one of those things that helped clobber the Edsel as well as anything else. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. When when Steve and I were at the Udvar Hazy uh, Smithsonian recently, when we went where they just have all these beautiful handmade models, and some of them were factory models, and we found this big, probably what one one twenty four scale X thirteen Vertijet on the that somebody uh, had yep. made. It. And I and of course I immediately launched in what you were just talking about this tirade about how you know Ravel had this one thirty second with all the parts and everything. And then they, I think they even cut the bolts. They didn't put it in production. My God, you know, you know what what madness. And um, yeah, it, those models were beautiful that it, we just saw. It, if that mold yeah. still exists somewhere, and somebody finds it, it it's a specialty oh, thing. Perfect. But that mold, you have driven, you've driven cars made out of that mold for years. <laughs> you, you're yeah, killing man. me, Steve. You're killing me, man. Um, yeah. but, and, and you do know the rest of the story is that uh, Ryan uh, went to Aurora yeah. in West Hampton, New York, and they're the ones who did the kit for Buck 98. Yeah, but you got a, you got a Buck 98 Aurora kit. Um, yeah. The one I have is, uh, is a, a, a Mach 2. It's the only Mach 2 kill I've built, built so far. And um, don't get me wrong. I think the guy who, I think he's retired now, who started Mach 2, he's in France. Uh, I won't say his name's Rene, but, you know, he, he, he started this thing out of whole cloth. God bless him. There, it's, it's weird. It's, it's kind of a, it, you're talking about funny styrene. It almost feels a little bit like resin, a little bendy, but it just, it just, but, it, you know, but nothing in that thing fit without a fight. It's, it's not a beginner's kit. And there were a couple of times it almost flew into the wall. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I managed not to. And uh, now that it's on the shelf and all painted up, and uh, I'm real happy with it. But uh, And the thing is, you get these companies like Anagrand and Mach 2 that make stuff nobody else makes. So, uh -huh. you know, if you want to build it, unless you want to scratch build it, you're kind of stuck with them. And... Uh, no, don't even get me started about kits that should be built. Well, actually, <laughs> actually, I guess I might as well go. To, that actually kind of works as a segue. I um just stumbled onto a video today. I've always been curious. You guys remember the uh, Douglas XB42, the 
mix master, the twin pull push uh, yep. pusher. Okay. Um, which I, I've seen the one at the Air and Space Museum. Uh, well, the fuselage of it. it, it it's the one with the two singular canopies. And uh, I uh, was like, you know, I know they only make two of them, but that would have been a cool kit. The only the only kits I could find uh, um, were double AM this uh, company on the upper left, which uh, and Anagram and and a, you know, a couple of uh, vacuum form or, or resin companies. That was it. And I was thinking. I you know, I like the name of that kit. Yeah. It, well, the thing is, is that the airplane, I went and watched a couple of documentaries on it. And Douglas was really on to something with this. And it's, I started thinking, you know, this kind of reminds me of that German push-pull, the Dornier 335, except both props are in the back instead of one in front and back. So I went and got a little data on the two of them. Now, everybody and their brother makes a copy of the Dornier 335, and they only built they didn't build that many of them and it never actually saw combat although one of them did run away from some uh french flown royal air force uh hawker tempests which was the fastest low altitude fighter single engine fighter uh in the european theater and the guy was moving the airplane and he saw the tempest and they saw him the the four french pilots dove on him he gunned it and the, the, they reported that this thing ran away from us you know we couldn't catch it the feel was fast well, so was the Douglas. Now, the Douglas is a bomber, but you realize that conceptually these are the same thing. Just one of them has uh, shafts with both props in the back, and one of them has an engine in front and an engine in the middle shafted to the rear. But the concept of, you know, pro basically coaxial propellers that counter-rotate. I didn't realize the Douglas, you know, it was slower than the field, but it was a bomber. And that thing could do over 400 miles an hour before the end of the war. And Douglas was really onto something, and that's the one that had the double bubble canopy on it. And I always felt like, man, you know, they in fact they, they tried converting it into a jet uh, because that's what it, the thing was is the airplane was actually making they having some vibration problems and stuff. And uh, but you're talking about a bomber that's only about sixty miles an hour slower than Germany's fastest fighter. A Messerschmitt one hundred nine probably couldn't have caught it, at maybe a K model, but. And people go, well, you know, the field was 60 miles an hour faster. It would have caught up to him. Like, dude, uh, you may not know this, but the XB-42 actually did have defensive guns. Uh, and they're, ironically, they were mounted in the wings. And it was, uh, I guess, a pair of 50 cals. And you got to stop and think. 60 miles, he'd have to be a stern chase because if he came head on, he'd have a, a shoot window of about a half a second. So it had to be a stern chase. Well, if you're closing at 50 or 60 miles an hour, you're basically just a target. You know, um, the uh, th that, that's almost the perfect speed to close at for a gunner to get a fix on you. And I was just thinking that, you know, that, that the Douglas really had a cool idea with this airplane. And part of me is just like, it's just such a bummer that it didn't catch on. But the war ended just as the thing was getting the kinks worked out of it. And yep. uh, of course, jets were on the scene. As, as were there, as were so many other aircraft around that time too. Yeah, but they didn't look as cool as this thing did. And this thing also <laughs> set a uh, speed record across the United States. From uh, I uh, forget which airbase it was uh, in California or which, which it might have been the Douglas facility in Long Beach. I forget, but it went all the way to bowling nonstop. And about the time I can do it in an Airbus. Maybe yeah, an hour they left longer. From, they left from Muroc, which is now Edwards. Oh, Muroc, okay. Yeah. But. And, and by the way, I don't know if you ever saw a photo. I can send it to you. You can put it up next time. But there was an airliner version concept of that. Really? They, yes, there was an airliner version concept. You're going to love the name. It was called, at that time, it was called the DC 8. Ha 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 ha. Oh. <laughs> I have, I have a rendering of it at Glendale Air Terminal in, in Burbank, in Glendale. If I ever make my own... Loading passengers, it was a, an honest-to-God airline baggage uh, convert, you know, the version of the XB-42. I'll send it to you after we sign off. Absolutely. Next time. If, I, if I ever make my counterfactual history alternative universe movie, that's going to be in there. <laughs> good-looking airplane it's got you know people getting on board and baggage being loaded and the whole thing I, i'll send it to you okay oh and, by, and you're gonna love this and guess what's flying overhead a dc-3 
<laughs> what was that old joke when they parked the, when they, when they parked the last DC eight? The crew will be ferried home in a DC three. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Exactly right. Not too far from the truth. Yeah. But but that that kind of leads us back to the question though about what models you would not build. Like, and I, I wanted the uh, nuclear that that Westinghouse nuclear power plant, which apparently was another dud kit. That now they're really expensive. Yeah. Um, but if I got one, I'd be afraid to build it because they're worth so much. And everybody probably has that one. Everybody has that one kit in their collection that they're not going to build. But, and that's it. And uh, Steve, didn't you were talking about what is it? The Slant Six was that it? I have the uh, motorized Slant Six, and I have the later one, which is the collectible bunk. Yeah. Crank one. So, so no, are you, no, it's electric motored. But are you going to build it? Does? No, the, 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 the hand cranked ones are not the, the ones that are sought after. Same thing for the Visible V8. It's the one with the electric motor. Wow. That That's what I thought. Yeah, but they repop the we V8 see. so you can build it without destroying a vintage kit. Are you ever going to build that Slant 6? Um, I'm thinking about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Crime against but. history. Um, it's a little, little. It, it's a little hard to, you know, it's a little hard to, you know. I mean, I paid a ton of money for it. And the minute you start yeah, snipping yeah, parts yeah. off, you can hear it. It all evaporates. <laughs> well, Steve, yeah, in that, your case, your your yeah. son is going to inherit all your kits, so you might as well go ahead and yeah. get one. Yeah, because they'll wind up on eBay for a dollar. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know. Well, you know, that... Or as he used to tell me, that he would come down in the basement and look around and go, yes, when you're gone, this will all be on eBay. That, that's, well, you know, I would say that's a painful thing, but you realize that means it's got a good chance of going to a good home. Well, you know. I mean, unless unless you you it, it does something. So what yeah, we're getting at is there are, the, you know. so, so what we're driving at is there are certain kits that the value in them isn't in building them, but in having them. Which is a thing. Well, it, it, let me put it this way. It's like anything that's collectible. It's only valuable if there's somebody else that wants to pay the price for it. Nicely put. All right. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll put a slight twist on that. Uh, I, I mean, I agree. But well, that's the old saying. A thing is worth what someone will pay for it. But what, what, the way I would look at it is more like this. If you derive pleasure from having it, then it has value to you. And that's the only one it really matters about. Because, well, well, you know. Look, look, I have that, I have that nuclear power plant kit. And, and it's a complete kit. There's every part is there. Okay? And I could build it, and it would look great. Mm. But I know it'll never be made again. And, you know, it's it's worth more unbuilt than it would be built, and I just can't bring myself to build it. That brings up the dilemma of there, there, there's really two dilemmas about building the rare kits, like the uh, Ravel uh, uh, Lockheed Electra airliner, you know, because mm -hmm. they destroyed the mold to make the the Orion. So, and what was the other one? Was it the uh, which one was it they destroyed to make? Was it the, to make the El Camino? The, the, the uh, Ford uh, 57 Ford Country Squire station wagon. Yeah. Uh, okay, and they destroyed that to make the El Camino. So, if they I was made the Ranchero out of it. Yes. It's, yeah, exactly. They, they, so they ruined. They they modified the mold, and you'll never see it again. And Which, when those things show up on eBay, they're usually in the hundred and fifty to three hundred dollar range. Yeah. Bill Paul brings up an interesting point. He said. I would go ahead and build a, a, a rare kit to help my fellow collectors. My, <laughs> kit, my kit out of circulation and will bump up the value of the Wait, ones that's right left. Yeah. There, there is something to be said for that. Um, the uh, when I uh, when I was uh, when, Mike, do you happen to know when Ravel modified the Electra mold to the P three? Uh, Sixty two, I believe. Okay, so it was I was one year old. Because so, okay, it, 60, 61 or 62. Okay. The original okay. Kit was 58. Okay. Okay, Mike. What is the rarest version of that kit? Which one? The 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 uh, electric. Uh, there. Well, there's two Dodgers. Right. 
the Dodgers. Yeah, the Dodgers yep. one came in a white box with blue yep. type, and they sold yep. it right along next to the Dodger dogs at the Dodger Stadium. Yep. It yep. was at Stadium. Yep, that's the rarest version. Yep. Okay, hold on. But you know what? I'd, I'd rather have the American Airlines because that cover art, here we, we're back to the cover art thing again, is probably one of, probably one of Jack's, God bless him, one of Jack's best ever uh, tricks on, on the modelers. And forgive me for going back to this, but I, I just got to tell you, when you look at the cover, it's landing in the rain, right? Uh-huh. Yep. It's the runway is wet, and it's screaming along the runway, and it's passing the terminal, and there's hills in the background, and you see the tower with the, with the beacon. Folks, that's Burbank Airport. That's huh. the Hollywood Hills in the background. That's Burbank Airport. And he's passing the terminal. He's doing, what, about 160 knots. And that's, you know, he's, he's ripping along on that runway. Would you like to guess how much actual runway is left at that point? About 10 feet. <laughs> 2,000 feet, and you're on Hollywood Way. Woohoo! Good oh. jobs. So uh, every time, oh. there has not been a time that I've looked at that and just gone, wow, that's really great. Oh, my God. You know. Unless he's taking <laughs> off. Go around. Go around. There's, there's tension in that thing because you know what the, there's going to be a big noise in about three <laughs> seconds, you know. And, and I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just saying it was one of the most powerful, one of the most impactful covers he had ever done because if you know the scene and you know that airport, you sit there and go, wow, that's really, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, but maybe he's taking <laughs> off. <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm just saying maybe he's taking off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You display in Jay Leno's garage, <laughs> yeah. which is which is about a quarter mile from that exact spot. But uh, <laughs> the, the mood of that thing, not to mention that uh, uh, the final kick is that he moved the wing back about oh eight to ten feet on the actual fuselage length to uh, better show you the windows, doors, and the riding of American Airlines. But that's a whole other story. But anyway, uh, I don't know. Hold on, I'm, I'm putting a slide together super fast in real time. <laughs> which is coming up in three, two, one. Okay. Uh, you guys won't see it for about 20 seconds. I got a picture of the Dodgers Electra and the one you were just talking about so that now folks can, uh, while you're even talking to me, come on, click, 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 you know, trim, cut, paste. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, for some reason, I feel like I saw this kit for sale in a store, but since I was born in 61, that's just not possible. So I must have been confusing with another kid. But I do see what you're talking about. You know, the wet runway, the night, the light. Uh, um, I don't know if Burbank Tower had a see-through cab like that, but it's pretty wicked cool. Yes. Oh, it did. Oh, it, it did. It, I mean, it's a little bit modified, but if I showed you pictures of the airport from that exact spot, you'd sit there and go, oh, really? Wow. He just he just crossed the intersection of 1, 5, and 8, and, uh, and he's, he's landing on 0, 8, and it's like, oh, my gosh. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, judging but, by the hydroplaning those tires are doing, you know, even if those props are in full reverse, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, all, all the above. And on the other, just so you know, just to get you oriented, on the other side of those hills that you see under the word Electra, uh huh, that's where the Hollywood sign is. Ah, well, he maybe he's just doing some night training, touch and goes. Um, yeah. that but wing looks yeah, awfully. I see what I meant about the wing? Yeah, it's really back. short. <laughs> See how far back on the fuselage is way. Oh yeah, yeah. Kind of like was. Yeah. This? <laughs> it does. It does look a little awkward. Yeah, and those two little windows above the word American are the lavatories, so those are quite large size uh, suites. Uh, <laughs> I guess they include showers. You know, but you know, he's got a ton of room from the. And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just saying, look from the door to the uh, the first window under airlines. I that, guarantee that's a, you. That's a, huge area that he just lengthened to make it look cool. I will wager you $50 in a box of donuts that when that came out in 58, those things, I mean, it got, I mean, I don't know if they sold very well, but I guarantee you that box art got a lot of attention. Absolutely. And I see we're talking about the primary colors, you know, he's got, I mean, of course he has to paint it the way American paints their airplanes, but I still see how the airplane pops out with the dark background, the yellow lights reflecting off the the uh, mm -hmm. the water and everything and of course mm -hmm. the strobe uh, the beacon on top of the airport adding that Casablanca feel um, yep. you know you and I talked about this the first phone call we ever had Mike 
You know, and I talked about uh, Jack's box art for the uh, uh, Jupiter, the Explorer One rocket. Uh-huh. And the thing about, you know, where you see it, you're like looking from underneath the rocket, looking up as it's lifting off. And the thing yeah. about it that caught my attention was he put the three spotlights on the uh, tower looking down yeah. at you. And I remember that. Yeah. It, just, it just sort of created this ethereal atmosphere. Uh-huh. Um, so, in fact, maybe that's the phrase I'm looking for is atmosphere. And, uh, you, you, somehow, you know, the art is more interesting Roy, than life. Roy has a great idea for Twilight Zone episode. What's okay. that? He said there's a uh, a worldwide apocalypse and a lone survivor emerges from the rubble <laughs> and finds the only hobby store completely stocked with kids and there's no glue. <laughs> <laughs> they they did that episode with Burgess Meredith, you know, you know, when he's the guy who's trying to read all the time, he survives the apocalypse or smashes his episode with the uh, glasses. Yeah, with the glasses. And uh um now what's the story on this Dodgers Electra? It was a promo. By who? It was a promo. I, I didn't hear the they, did they did it with Ravel. The Dodgers, when they they were just moved to LA, they had their own company plane. Yeah, oh. it was an Electra. Right. And they approached, you know, they approached Ravel to make it for them in their livery so they could sell it at the stadium, which they did. Huh. That's the only place you could get it. What did they make? I don't know. Um, I had heard. Well, a, a normal run for Ravel was a hundred thousand for pressing. So I'm guessing the the, the Dodgers Electra was maybe ten. Yeah, that would be right. Like that. I mean, it was it was yeah. way less, but it was just still enough to be, you know, have ample supply at the uh, at the park. And uh, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that only, they only made one pressing of that. Yes, they did. Yes, yeah, and 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 the and the only thing they had to do was do a box, and like you said, it was a white box yeah. with a black and white and blue label, so it wasn't right. anything exotic. And you know. Yeah, and by the way, I have to smile looking at the skyline of L.A. on the tail there. That's the skyline yeah. of the city with City Hall, all, you know, 25 stories of it. <laughs> uh, whatever. The, only thing that, the only thing that's missing is Superman flying by it. Yeah. Yeah. Da-da, da-da, da-da. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, the, the first Dodger airplane, just so you know, the first I believe the Dodgers were the first team to have their own airplane. And the first was a converted Eastern Convair uh, 440. Well, that's pretty spiffy the for the time. Way, and the, re- the reason they had the plane was because when they moved, they were the only West Coast space team. I was going to say uh, that, that so they were further away. They had further to travel. Yeah. Right. They had to travel far for all of their away games. And it wasn't until, I think, about two years later that the Giants moved to San Francisco. Uh-huh. So that's why they had a plane, because they were always traveling right. to make games. Thanks oh. for answering. And I just realized something. See where the baseball is? Uh-huh. Who uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Where's the Eastern Meatball on an Electra? Oh yeah, same spot. Same spot. Yep. Love it. Great. Made that easy. Um. The other thing too, the Dodger mm-hmm. Electra was molded in white plastic, if I remember correctly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the Revell uh, uh, American Airlines was silver. silver. Yeah. Okay. All right, All right Mike. It's a New Yorker. Here's a piece of trivia for you. Okay. Okay. We all know why the Dodgers left. New York to Brooklyn to go to LA. Mm-hmm. What's built on the site where where they wanted to build the Dodgers Stadium that Robert Moses wouldn't let them have the land? Oh, I don't I don't know the answer, but I can't wait to hear. The Barclay Center. Oh, for gosh sake! Huh? <laughs> What's that? Was, the Barclay Center is the arena that the uh, Nets play in. Oh, that's right. Uh, oh. And it was, it's at the terminus of the Long Island Railroad and the mm-hmm. subway. Yeah. And so it would have taken people from the five boroughs, you mm-hmm. could have taken the subway. Mm-hmm. And if you lived on Long Island, which a lot of Dodger fans did because they were in Brooklyn, you could have taken the Long Island Railroad and got there. And that was why, that was why he wanted that piece of land and Robert Moses wouldn't sell it to him. It's, right. it's, it's, it's ironic that the, the trains were so involved the Dodgers because according to a documentary I saw they're called the Dodgers because back when the team was new street cars people had to dodge the street cars to get over there yeah. and, uh, yeah, 
and, and I, if, correct me if I'm wrong, they played in Ebbets Field in Brooklyn? Yes, yeah, yes. Which there's a, ha a housing project there now. Brooklyn Bombs, remember that? <laughs> yeah. And, uh. and what Robert, Robert Moses wanted them to move to where Shea Stadium is now, or was, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to go there. They said, we're the Brooklyn Dodgers, we're not the Queens mm -hmm. or the Long Island Dodgers. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't sell them the land, so, you know, O'Malley said fine, and he moved them to L.A. All right, here, here's a di I don't want to go too far off the rails. Here's a diorama that somebody should build. You ready? Okay. Yeah. Mayor, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia refusing to get off a uh, Ford Trimotor in, at Newark because he bought a trip from Chicago to New York, and he was in New Jersey, and he wouldn't get off the airplane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they, they flew him to Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn, and, and that solved that problem. But then they said, you know, we should probably have our own airport, and there's this place called North Beach up by... Flushing, Long Island, yep. and we'll turn that into an airport. You know, I don't know what it's called today. LaGuardia Airport. Called LaGuardia. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so that's why they named it after Fiorello. <laughs> that's, that's how it happened. He wouldn't get off the plane because he yeah. was in New Jersey and he bought a ticket to New York. Interesting. True story. Well, you know, when they first had what they called transcontinental air service, the tri-motors, you took a train to Chicago, then you got on the airplane. Uh, uh, like the Trimotors couldn't fly at night or in weather, so. So here, Mike, here is, uh, I'm putting up a picture of somebody I just found online of a buildup against the box. Nice. So nice. everybody can look at what you were talking about, the difference in the actual shape of the model and the artwork. And, uh, and the wings are still fairly stubby, <laughs> yeah, but, um, the, uh. It's a nice model. Uh, it is. And, uh, even that's a built. a factory buildup. Beautiful. Oh, that's, oh, that's a factory buildup. Okay. Yeah, it's a factory builder. And uh, that kit's probably, well, okay. that's one model, and it's probably worth as much as an unbuilt kit. And mm -hmm. that one can you, how can you tell? Say again? How can you tell it's a factory buildup? Because he knows Yellow the, prop tips. Ah. Plus, plus Mike, Mike knows pretty much every photo of every buildup. <laughs> And, and, the, and the color, the win that was the Revell window light, window. Window, by the way, also. The, right. the, the windows were like that. I have a DC-7 that's similar. And uh, meanwhile, that, that would have been a great job to have as a teenager. Oh, God, building model <laughs> airplanes, building the build ups that would have been great. Yeah, you know who actually this is interesting. You know who actually built those factory build ups were the women, uh, yes, they called the back room, and there were women with uh, uh you know, names like Edith and Shirley and, and yeah. Betty and and then Sylvia, and uh, they wore aprons and they built those models by the hundreds, if not thousands. And it was told to me by a hobby shop owner, those were incentives given to hobby shops that they'd order a gross of a gross small model, 144. Yep. Yeah. And, and you got the cardboard display. Yeah, they, they did those yep. too also. But that, that's what yep. they, th these were Revell promotions for hobby shop owners to order 144 of a certain kit. Yep. And back in the day, that was not a lot of kits for a hobby store to sell of a particular kit. Well, yeah, if I may, the, the guy that told that to me had a hobby shop in Burbank. And, or his oh, father okay. did, I should say. His father had a hobby shop in Burbank. And I said, did, uh, how, you know, how many kits did your dad order? And he said, well, when Burbank is where Lockheed is located, right? Okay. And he said, when the F-104 Starfighter came out in 1957, I guess, or 57 or 58, uh, his dad ordered a gross of F-104 kits, and they sold out in two weeks. Uh Hmm. <laughs> well, I have to confess, I bought the same kit more than once because I usually had to replace the one I'd blown up with firecrackers. Yeah, well, I, I bought that. It's, it's funny you should mention that. I bought that and the Sidewinder missile version because I just wanted to make it look better than the first time I tried it and blew it. So <laughs> hey. it was a do-over. But, but 144 kits in two weeks. They said they just blew out the door because everybody worked on it, and they all came to the store and cleaned them, you know, cleared them out. Well, uh, I will tell you, if, the build -ups are. It, as a working airline right. pilot, if you were to build a model of like a civilian airliner and put mm -hmm. sidewinders on it, the first thought yeah. that would go through my mind is, are we planning a merger? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, that, that's too much of an inside airline joke. You know, uh, Mergers are always a bloodbath, and they always talk about, you know, during a merger, it's a good thing those things don't have missiles on them to be shooting at each other. But... Um, by the way, one quick point I wanted to make, uh, and we'll get right back. 
Uh, somebody was asking about submitting photographs to a fine scale modeler. Just got my new one today. And you're going to need to go. I got this thing at Colonial Photo in Orlando, uh, Hobby and Photo. This is a gray card or grayscale card. They're just called a gray card. Um, if you guys want to submit your photographs to magazines, it helps to take a photo with this gray card in the picture, then remove it and then take more pictures because they use these things. I guess, what is it, Mike, to get the color palette right? And uh, uh, I know a lot of guys are talking about they sent stuff to, to a fine scale modeler and said, did you use a gray card? Because if you didn't, you put them at a real disadvantage. They get hundreds of photos a month, and they don't even always run a viewer's gallery anymore. Um, so anyway, uh, back to uh, fun times at the hobby shops and blowing up models. Uh, okay, so Mike, let, here's a question for all of us on this. What was your first model kit that you ever built? Um, huh. I'm hesitating because there was a couple of little qualifications. I'm going to say the first honest to gosh model, plastic model kit that I built with my father, God bless him, God rest his soul, uh, in the basement of our house was the Ravel American uh, DC-7 airliner. Okay. Max? 1959. Uh, uh, 55, I'm sorry. 55. Uh, Air Max? The Airfix BTK bagged. Spitfire came in a bag with a plastic header on it, blue. Oh wow! And I remember and? I didn't know they were water slide decals. I tried to tape them on. <laughs> what was yours, Steve? I, I well, honestly I don't remember. I must have been five or six when I got my first kit. It, I'm sure it was a fighter or something, but I don't remember which one. Uh, uh, it was the Ravel Jeep with trailer, which oh, you just wow. got recently. Which I which I searched crazily for for years and finally found one on eBay that was untouched. Oh my god! And, and I bought it and I built it and I put it in a window box with the box and I made a sign that I put above it that said, "And this is how it all began." <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's sweet. Now, Mike, was yours the United or the American? What's that? You said it was a DC-7? That was the, the 1955 American first issue. Okay. I was looking for a picture to throw up real quick, but the only one I found was, uh, I guess, for Liddell or because it's in Spanish. Uh, that's the one with hey. uh, it's coming in at night. Coming in at night with the landing lights and the whole thing and uh -huh. uh, crossing the road, which, uh, you know, I said was Idlewild Airport, and if you're in L.A., it's LAX, but that's a whole other conversation. But uh, that was the first one I built, and I just remember um, thinking how real it looked, how, how it looked like the real airplane, which we had seen at Idlewild a week or two before. And it just it looked so real. I, I was just astonished. And it's a very happy memory, a very wonderful memory. I didn't have my dad long, but that was one of the, one of the special moments. We, we did that one in the SS United States Ocean Liner together, and that was really special. I'm throwing a picture of it up here, although this one apparently was made for, the I guess, the Latin American market. But... Uh... There, there it is with the landing light going and everything. And it does, uh, again, you know, it, w with the night scene and the lights and everything, it does evoke the, the glamour of travel. Mm -hmm. this, this one was made to go to Brazil, Industria, Ravel, Industria, Bra Brasil, Brasilia, Brasiliera. Yeah, that's and, the one. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Chris thinks we're boring. <laughs> Well, we are. <laughs> Steve, I thought you were going to put a sign on, on your on your kit saying, "Okay, to your son, you well, sell it. let me spice things yeah. up." Then, would uh, I tell you what, Steve? Uh, yeah. Why don't you tell them what you heard on the phone in real time today? I'll see if I can throw up some pictures, and uh, then I'll tell them from my perspective. Okay, so now which discussion are we referring to? Crash, boom, bang. What? Crash, boom, oh. Oh, yeah, no. I, I was, Max put up a picture of uh, the uh, the windscreen from the Jupiter 2. Okay, hold on. Yeah, okay. I saw that. And it had the rules. So, so I called him up and I said, what happened? And oh, hold on, I'm going to try, I'm going to try and put these pictures up as your talking about it so they can see what happened. Um, Don't you mean this view screen? Yes. Since there's no yeah. wind in space? Yes. The non-windshield. <laughs> yes. 
So, so. I am putting up one of the most embarrassing photographs of my model building career right now. <laughs> so he says, oh, you know, he said, I was doing this, and it was here, and this, and I used this, and it got on it, and then I'm trying to take it off. And, and all of a sudden... Hold on, hold on. We want to time this where it comes up together. Oh, oh, okay, right, three, first, two, one, me. now. <laughs> and then I hear oh. this hellacious scream and a crash. Okay? Oh. And I hear some expletives being voiced. There's still a blue cloud hanging over the Tarbis. <laughs> what happened? He said, I moved and the thing fell on the floor and the light broke off and it got all. I was like, oh, God. Uh, so he simulated the landing on the planet with the Jupiter 2? That is precisely what I did. Upside down. <laughs> oh. Oh, but there's more. Uh, here's here's, oh, a, pic here's a picture. Yeah. Here's, a, here's a picture of the Jupiter 2. Uh, the only thing that really got it was it broke a landing gear off, which was able to glue back in without too much trouble. Okay? But... That was the that was the minor uh, catastrophe. All right. A while later, we're still yakking. I'm in my big red rolly chair, and I yeah. I'm getting on the edge. And to quote Martin Martian, there was an earth shattering kaboom. Yes, yes. As I was talking to him, we're talking, and I hear this yell and this crash. Where he fell out of his chair. I fell out of the chair. <laughs> I lean so far forward reaching for something, and this is this chair has wheels on it, and it just shot out from under me. It squirted me out like a bar of soap. <laughs> this is the impact this is the impact site after cleanup. You're just having all kinds of fun today, weren't you? <laughs> it's a miracle I didn't hurt myself. Um, it, was that, it was at that time I thought I should move on as he needed to be by himself. <laughs> I think Steve was considering just calling an ambulance. <laughs> Look, I'm not sure where he lives. but and, 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 I, and Monica comes in a few minutes later and he says, I fell out of my chair. And she was like, what? What? Are you all right? I was like, come on. <laughs> now, if you... If you look at the if you look at the photograph of the shelf, she heard it all the way in the house. No, no, I came inside afterwards, dusted myself off, and uh, I looked at her. Steve and I were on the phone. I looked at her. And said, I just went. I fall down. Go boom. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if if you look at this photograph, you'll notice all these models were facing forward before I hit the ground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I managed to move a dozen models on a shelf without touching any of them. <laughs> so, so Jay and Chaldick shoot puts up match like the Cyclops falling and lost in space. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was like, uh, you have got to be kidding me. Now, since I showed you that, I will go ahead and give you guys a sneak peek, though. I, I did essentially finish off the Jupiter 2. I fabricated a new windshield because I'm just going to tell you what happened. All right. You uh, it, 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 it's happened to all of us. It, there's nothing new about it. Okay. I'm painting the Jupiter two, uh, or sanding it, painting it, sanding it, painting it, sanding it. And it's just, I, there's a whole tube of Bondo in this thing. Those seams were like drinking the, uh, the putty. God, I went numb sanding this thing. <laughs> And now we know it wasn't an earthquake, it was Max hitting the floor. <laughs> that very well may be the case, but oh, but there's more. Uh, sorry, Mike, don't mean to steal your line, but um, so as I'm working on this thing, I uh, uh, just putting the putty on it, I had the windshield glued into place, I was going to tape it up before I spray painted it. Here you see it all taped up. Uh, but uh, I, um, I, I I was using just, you know, the spatula and my fingertip to, um, to, to, to run the putty through the seam. And there's one down the bottom. Of course, the seam goes across the top. And I figured this is not a big deal. I don't, I don't need to tape up the windshield 
just to, uh, to, to, to put a little putty onto my finger, right? Um, and somehow, I think some, a little putty got on the side of my hand. <laughs> and a, li a little about... <laughs> what? Max falls on the floor in Florida would create a sinkhole. Sorry, Max. <laughs> and there's a dent in the floor of the Tarvis. Anyway, uh, so I try to pick it off with a toothpick, and that doesn't work. And I, so I get a Q-tip, and I'm using a little uh, paint remover. But the stuff, it looks like it's come out, but then when it dries, it, you know, you can see it. And as I keep trying to clean it, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And finally, I realized that there's this putty has just somehow created an unremovable film, and it may even be damaging the acrylic. And I'm going to have to fabricate a new windshield. Not the end of the universe. Pretty straightforward piece to make. Um, but it was just one of those things that the was viewport. Uh, the viewport. Yes, Ken, the viewport. <laughs> but it, it was just an aggravating thing to have to do because it just was so unnecessary. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm just dabbing the stuff on with my finger. Yet I still somehow managed to get it on the viewport, and uh, I think this is the uh, yeah. So um, I, I I get my clear styrene and I trace everything out from the uh, original piece, which is all in one piece. It's just gummed up, and uh, I, I put it in, and and, and it actually works pretty good the only problem is it slides while it's drying so on the inside it gets a little glue smear but i'm like you know what at this point i'm just gonna live with it it's that or i cut a whole new one and uh there's a point in time when you start getting your wits in now i didn't uh when i was done i just thought this thing just looks like you know a uh, a, a silver pie plate so I decided to weather it up a little bit. That's my new recreated windshield. Um, and uh, I weathered it up a little bit. And uh, so now it's... Uh... <laughs> Garfield said, now we know why the Jupiter never made it back to Earth. <laughs> Actually, I, I argue that. This is what it would look like when it got Earth. By God, some wear and tear. Um, Monica doesn't really like it when I weather them. She prefers the factory new look, but I'm just kind of like, look, I got to cover my mistakes somehow. Um, Tom Fox says Max follows Boeing assembly processes. Ow, too soon. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so uh, you know, slide it in a hanger, but it's. Uh, Bill Paul says, just remember, half of model building is solving problems. Half of the problems are self-induced. This is oh so true. <laughs> it, 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 the skill is getting out of your own way. And uh, yeah. now, is this picture with the new? Um, the, the yes, new that's board? the new. That's the new windshield. Yeah, it looks fine. And uh, I never really cared that much for the one from the movie, which I had up on the shelf. So now this one is up on the shelf, uh, looking down on us. Put the screen there we go. Uh, there it is up on the uh, sci-fi shelf. And uh, all like done. the hanger you have for it in your desk. Yeah, it really fit in there perfectly. It does That does look like uh, like a hanger made for it. and uh, But I weathered it up a little bit, and uh, um, I felt it just That's needed. That's right. It just That's needed. cover your mistakes, just weather it up. Well, it, 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 it actually worked out pretty well. I mean, I, I actually like the way it looks. I mean. You know, uh, you know, you you put a little grunge. In. You ever notice? I was like, they're always going in and out of the door. So I put some mud down around the bottom of the door. You know, where they would have been, because I think it was parked in the dirt half the time. And uh, um, so this is the way it would look when they finally got back to Earth. You know, a little worn, a little torn, but none the worse for wear. Bill Paul, Bill Paul says, just like building armor, hide your screw ups with weathering. <laughs> That's all freaking lootly. And battle damn it. How many times a kid did we say battle damage? Um, but uh, it's battle damage. Oh, by the way, I uh, was telling you guys. <laughs> how long will it be on? The, how long will this be on the shelf? <laughs> no, it's it's gonna live up there. Uh, transform fit the screen. Uh, going back to what we were talking about earlier. These are a couple of the comps uh, uh, that uh, were Jack Linwood's uh, for the for the actual boxes you see next to them. 
And uh, Mike, you still here? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, you want to explain comps to him real quick? Oh. I'm, I'm uh, showing those two comps of, uh, of Jack's D7 yeah, and SE5. Yeah. Comp uh, is the, uh, stands for comprehensive, and it's called the middle step. When uh, art is created uh, commercially or anytime, uh, you go with a rough concept, which is usually, you, you heard the term back of the napkin sketch or back of the envelope, and that's a rough. The comp is a uh, more ref more developed version of that, but not the final art yet, and there still could be changes made. And then the final art is what you see on the boxes. So um, if you look at those uh, matted pieces of art, um, they're pretty close to the final, uh, but uh, not exact. And so, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're original pieces of art. They're small and uh, classic Lenwood. You know, he just banged those, he, those things probably took... Uh, uh, maybe an hour, hour and a half, something like that. It took me that long to take the photos. Yeah. But, uh, so probably, probably 60 to 90 minutes, something, somewhere in that area. I have my pilot room festooned with all the comps, and of course I have, uh, was it Mort Kunstler's uh, Aurora Era Commander as a centerpiece, and uh, that's just where I have my coffee sit back. It's, it's my happy place where I go to relax. And it's not only because it's Mort and Jack's handiwork, personally. I mean, I do feel like I've I don't want to say met the man, but at least, you know, I've got the connection. Um, mm -hmm. but, but it's more than that. It's that I just enjoy looking at them, and it's just the, the history, of, not only the history they represent, but the history of the arc itself. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I, um, I, I, of all, you know, I, I, if you'd asked me 20 years ago, my idea of art, you know, would, you know, would have been a, you know, a poster. Because <laughs> I... And I've learned so much in the meantime, but I've come to appreciate it. And the more I learn about how quick these guys were and how good they were, the more I, I stand in awe of what they can do. And, that, and by the way, Mike, I've seen your work also. That's also, I said there, look, I can't draw a straight line. Um, but, uh, well, you know my retort to that, and I say this with great love and respect, I can't fly a jet, so we're even. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I want to... If you look at the SC5, there's a great example of moving from a comp to a finish. I just noticed it. You ready? Uh-huh. Look at the upper left wingtip of the comp uh -huh. relative to the white. Uh, what is that in the background, the white German plane? Uh, the Fokker D7. Sorry? Fokker D7. Okay, so look at the wingtip of the, the upper wingtip of the SE5 in the comp relative to the, um, the German airplane, D7. Uh huh. In the in the com, in the comp, you see where the tip is uh, relative to the Iron Cross. Yes. Look at it on the cover. Okay, it's actually it's touching it. Touching, yeah. Was there a, is there a, uh, a you think that was I mean I assume everything was done consciously so. What do you think the... It looks like it might be a little further back also. Yeah, we, we call it a tangent, and uh, the the, uh, the catchphrase is eye magnet, and okay. it attracts your eye and makes you look at it. All right. That's exactly what it did, but that, that's a subtle change. By the way... They look pretty, they look, they look pretty close, but um, look at the rigging in the comp is much rougher and thicker, mm -hmm. and then look at the rigging in the final. Okay, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Now the it comp would have been done. The, the, yeah. the comp would have been in what? A gouache or watercolor? Designer's gouache, which is a water-based tempera. Yeah. Would you think the same thing for the final, or would that have been done in something else? No, that's exactly the same. Okay. By the way, just as an interesting aside, just coincidence, that white D seven, believe it or not, is Herman Gehring's airplane, and huh? uh, that happens to be, I guess, he was staying with a the theme. The the box the airplane that's in the other box the same white D seven. Uh, ah, now I could be wrong. I say it's Herman Herman Gehring flew a white D seven. He may not have been the only one who did. Okay. Okay. But he was in Rick Tobin's flying circus. I but I, I made that assumption. But now I think about yeah. it. Um, but anyway. I also noticed the round the roundo on the lower wing is in a different position on the SC five from the comp to the final. Oh line. yeah 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 yeah. All that subtle stuff, you know. But that's. That's why they do that middle step, so that you discover all that stuff and then move to the real thing. 
Yeah, yeah, those I have. I have a stack of those kits, and I built them in three different levels. I built one like I built it as a kid, just pure naked with nothing but the decals. Uh, I built one with the McCudden propeller, and that one's rigged. Um, that was the first time I rigged a one seventy second scale airplane. Oh, and uh, that is kind of what led me to the false belief that it wouldn't be too much trouble to uh, rig the uh, the Douglas Royal Cruisers. I was like, well, I did that SE5, and it's even smaller. Yes, but there's one SE5. <laughs> and it has much simpler rigging, by the way. Um, but, uh, and by the way, those Douglas Royal Cruisers that, that they're sitting on the shelf uh, in the target, I'm just one of many projects I haven't given up on that. I'm still going to get to it. Uh, but, that, but then I found this photograph in one of the books that someone sent me of this magnificent uh, diorama guy did of the World Cruisers. And I was like, oh, God, <laughs> you know, that was so good. What's the point? I am not worthy. Um, but uh, but I'll get them done. Yeah, they had, that, they had that on display. That's up in Seattle now, I believe. But mm. I, they had that on display in the lobby of the Douglas Engineering Building when he, when he made that in, like, what, early 80s. And uh, I just remember walking into work one day and seeing this crowd of people in the lobby. And I was like, what's that? And I worked my way to the front and just went, oh, <laughs> you're kidding. And that yeah. was pretty stunning with the cranes and the water and all that stuff. It was spectacular. What scale were those models? Uh, I want to say, uh, God, one, they had to be bigger than one, 124th. Oh, okay. 132nd. All That's right. Not, they, were, they were good size. They were all good right. size. Good, because if, if when I looked at all the detail, if somebody told me that was one seventy second scale, I was just going to crawl in a corner and cry. No, 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 oh, no, no, no. <laughs> they were large. They were big. But um, I also uh, t today I did finishing the Jupiter two was the big focus. I also get stuff ready for this, and al also I wanted to uh, I finished off the little Lindbergh flying saucer, which is no big day. Just had some fun with that. But uh, getting back to what I was saying about how important, you know, Linwood's artwork was to me, I thought I would share this, and you guys have probably seen this before, but this is uh, how I display some of the models in my house, because I am a huge fan of those Ravel uh, 132nd scale fighters, and because, mainly because my brother had them when I was a kid, but I kept the box art to keep, you know, so uh, the top one, the Spitfire is my favorite, and the Wildcat, and then the uh, 109. And um, uh, let me, I think I took another picture. I might have a better. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, that's right. Uh, let me see if this one looks any better. Yeah, there. Now you can see it. Okay. Um, as most of you guys know, this uh, Spitfire Mark I of Jack's uh, from the late 1960s is my favorite box art in the world. I made the Spitfire to look just like it. And except I put a few bullet holes in it. Um, and uh, the, I put a lot of, I actually did a build video on that one a lot. That was one of the models I slowed down and took my time on. And uh, by the way, Mike, you'll appreciate this. It's also rattle canned. Um, I used okay. uh, paper and Play Doh to make it the feathered edge and worked fairly See, well. There is hope. There is hope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, but but that's another one. If you look at the if you look at that one oh nine behind him, he'd have to flunk, he would have to clip the nose off the Spitfire to be where he's at. <laughs> but I tell you that white that white underbelly, of course the Spitfire is such a beautiful airplane to begin with. And that elliptic wing, and you put that perfectly profiled behind the beautiful brown and, and green camo with the bright yellow and red and white blue uh roundels and everything against that blue sky, it just you know, it, it, it just, it's just, it's awe-inspiring. And like you say, he probably knocked that out in a day. And uh, this picture of the Wildcats, I didn't realize at the time that's probably Battle of Coral Sea. My brother had that one also. And I saw that and just looking at it made me want to go, you know, uh, join the Navy and be a pilot, which that was a, a real stretch. <laughs> and, uh, of course, the Messerschmitt, of course, I know they were the bad guys, but um, th that painting, you know, with the, searchlights in the background and the snow, you literally stand there, look at it, and you feel the cold. I mean, I don't yeah, that's, I just... that's, that's the power of good art. And by the way, I should mention, in terms of design of the box, uh -huh. you notice that the art is all by itself. There's no cut, there's no type or titles covering it. Yeah, it's so... just the artwork, which you can frame, you know, cut out and frame. And uh, a, a really quick little story on the, ME, on the BF-109. Uh-huh. 
Jack told me, he says, he read a, a flight report, pilot report, saying that the airplanes were very, very tricky to, because of the narrow tread of the landing gear. Yes, that They is were true. very tricky to land at night and in snow. Ah, so he created their nightmare scenario. <laughs> Check out the scene. I, I said, man, that it doesn't get any, any more direct than that, but... Uh, that's a lovely display, Max. That's really cool. Oh, thank you. Um, the um, the Galand uh, and a few others wrote in their books about the problems of the 109, and the landing gear probably accounted for just about as many losses as the Royal Air Force. Wow. But it was done that way for a reason. The Spitfire also has an outward swinging gear. Both of them bolted the landing gear to the fuselage. Actually, the Spitfires is in the wing. It's not actually on the fuselage. Mm -hmm. R.J. Mitchell did that on the Spitfire so that he wouldn't have a heavy would not have to have a heavy wing spar. Mm -hmm. Willie Messerschmitt sort of did the same thing, but he actually bolted the landing gear to the airframe because he knew that they were going to be on the march, field maintenance, and you could pull the wings off the plane, pick up the tail wheel, and tow it with a truck. There you go. And the re apparently, I don't know how true this is, but every book I've read has said that the reason that the Germans wanted the inverted V engine was so uh, they knew they'd be maintaining them in the field and it just made it easier to get the cylinder heads without any special equipment. Well, 109 required no special equipment uh, unless you were going to jack an engine out of it. Um, you just you could do everything, including pull the wings off and tow it with a, with, with a vehicle without any special tools. You know, it was, just, it was all about field maintenance. The airplanes are easy to produce. Uh, they were uh, extremely easy to maintain. The Spitfire, on the other hand, was rather particular about maintenance. And, uh, mm. and of course, the Navy put the crank-up Wildcat-style gear going back to their biplanes so that they could, well, they started off on biplanes, but also so that they, uh, you know, didn't interfere with the folding wing. But that yeah. tech, as we all know, that technology soon got surpassed. But anyway, that was just a piece of useless trivia for everybody. Win a bar bet, maybe. Um, well, wow, we only got like seven minutes left. Goodness gracious. Uh, I didn't realize we shot through this one. Um, well, guys, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming out. Uh, Mike, is there anything you wanted to bring up before we go? Mike? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I say, well, we're, 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 we only got a few minutes left. Was there anything you wanted to talk about or cover before we go? Oh, me? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that was to me. I no. thought that was to the to the uh, viewers. Um, so, I, as always, I thank you very much for, for hosting and for letting me uh, share some memories and all. And uh, uh, I've said many times that model box art was a pivotal inspiration to uh, uh, to my own work. Uh, you know, Jack was the first art teacher I ever had years before, decades before I ever met him. And I learned so much. But uh, uh, it just goes to show that uh, what's on the box really... Uh, you know, creates good good marketing and makes uh, made us all buy models, and that's why we're we're on the channel with you right now. Uh, Steve, no, I just uh, glad everybody's enjoyed the, the live stream tonight. There's been a lot of good comments, and uh, you know, it's always great having Mike on with his wealth of knowledge. Uh, you know, uh, it, it was a real good night, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um. Ken? Max, I'm always impressed with the the talent and the people that you attract to this channel. Me too. The, oh, they're amazing. The, the knowledge and the Thank skill you. that, well, <laughs> Steve accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just amazing that, you know, to be able to spend this time with, uh, with these people and um, it, it I enjoy it. I'm glad Max calls me. Oh, man. Um, no, uh, I'm going to, since we got a couple of minutes left, I'm going to shift gears and answer a question. Somebody asked, uh, I went and my wife and I went and saw the new Kong X, uh, Godzilla X Kong movie. <clears throat> uh, we had a great time. I enjoyed the movie. It is a, for you kaiju fans, it is a kaiju movie made for fans. Um, the humans are just in there to push the story along. It doesn't get bogged down in, in mopey characters. It's 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 got more of your monsters on the screen than anything else. It has surprisingly coherent storyline. Um, the one complaint I heard about Godzilla minus one, the recent Toho production, was too much people. 
it's funny because these two movies are very different in that regard. They're both great movies. I, 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 uh, I think Godzilla Minus One really moved the bar. Uh, but one is a story about people dealing with an impossible situation. And the other is about the kaiju and the people are just there to support the story. Completely different approaches to, movie, to, to making a kaiju film. Uh, but they were both great. I, um, if you go watch it, I think you'll enjoy it. If, if you just want to see monsters beating the crap out of each other, you won't be disappointed. And the other thing, it doesn't, unlike a lot of movies... It does not take, you know, it doesn't take any time. Well, it's just like both those movies got started quick. Um, no, I did not stab myself with tweezers this time. I, I'm learning to keep the sharp objects out of arm's reach. Um, HMS Ford wants to answer a, ask are there a any characters question. Named Ken? Uh, any of the characters named Ken? No, I don't recall a Ken. <laughs> um, although King Kong does have to go to the dentist, but... Uh, and, um, so, uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of sad. The movie starts off, Kong is showing some typical aging problems. I'm like, oh my God, they made this movie about me. <laughs> um, but, uh, anyway, it, 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 the movie has some humor. It has a lot of action. It's, uh, it's just a good film. And by the way, there is no post credit scene. Um, so, uh, once the movie's over, it's just no. over. No Easter egg at the end, huh? No Easter egg at the end. Drachnafell did it. Yes, I saw Drachnafell's, Drachinifell's, the guy who does the thing on ships, about he 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 does this very excellent, serious. He does with ships what I do with kit model companies. He gives a history of all these different kinds of ships, and he took the naval battle scene out of uh, Godzilla Minus One and did it like a documentary. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was an April Fool's gag. And... Uh, but anyway, um, so, uh, Natasha, you don't want to get Max mad at you. He is a captain also. <laughs> nope. Don't I'm, call him first mate. <laughs> don't even think about it. Um, uh, but, uh, I'm still getting used to calling you Captain Anson. Ken. Um, Anson. come on, Natasha. <laughs> God. Max is enemy number She's one, gravity. Me. Number two, paint. Number three, gravity. Wow. Yeah. I'm the Kung Fu Panda of model builders. But, uh... <laughs> Still got the job done. I tell you what, with that chair shut up, everybody had screwed. I was, I halfway expected Steve to call an ambulance. <laughs> I don't know where this guy lives exactly. You better track his phone, but I'm telling you what, I can feel it up here in Delaware. <laughs> That's you know, John Ashley says, my name's John. I haven't bought a kid since March 24th. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to do something about that, John, because you're in a room full of enablers. <laughs> well, everybody. He's in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's our shoe for tonight. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I didn't see if Trey was with us. Is Trey out there? Um, no, he was not on tonight. No, oh. Nor was Fran. Uh, well, I, I think Fran, yeah, I think they both have stuff going on, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to see uh, Trey tomorrow, drop him off that, uh, Thunderbird container dock. And, uh, the, you know, that kid actually is a lot more involved than I expected it to be, but then so is the C-57D that that's going to be a project. Now, a lot of people have been saying, you know, Hey man, go watch some videos on it. Cause there's a lot of traps in that thing. Um, so yeah, there are. But that's going to be a slow build. I'm, I'm, it's like the Arizona. I'm going to take my time to try to do a real nice job on that. Well, uh, guys, that's it for hey, tonight. Mike. Hmm? Yes. Hey, Mike. Yes. It, it, it's too bad you uh, you got out of the Mustang. I was on the phone with the guys from Galpin for about an hour yesterday. We could have hooked you up. Wow. Galpin Ford. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's another conversation for someday, but uh, we, we move on. It's going to be great talking to everybody. Thank you again. Same and, to uh, we'll look forward to more. Well, thanks, Mike. Thanks for coming out and joining us. We really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. We'll talk to you later, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, guys, that's our wrap for the night. I'm going to loop the intro so you guys can uh, chat with each other. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out. Take care of yourselves, and as always, model on.
should have known you'd bid me farewell. There's a lesson to be learned from this, and I learned it very well. Now I know you're not the only starfish in the sea. If I never hear your name again, it's all the same to me. And I think it's gonna be all right. Yeah, the worst is over now. The morning sun is shining like a red rubber ball. Never cared for secrets I'd confide to you. I'm just an ornament, something for your pride. Always running, never caring. That's the life you live. Stolen minutes of your time were all you had to give. And I think it's gonna be alright. Yeah, the worst is over now. The morning sun is shining like a red rubber ball. The stories in the past, with nothing to recall. I've got my life to live, and I don't need you at all. The roller coaster ride we took is nearly at an end. I bought my ticket with my tears. That's all I'm gonna spend, and I think it's gonna be alright. Yeah, the worst is over now. The morning sun is shining like a red rubber ball. It's gonna be alright. Yeah, the worst is over now. The morning sun is shining like a red rubber ball. Oh, oh, it's bouncing and it's shining like a red rubber ball. Well, hey, baby, jump over here when you do the. I wanna be near
Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da